This is Audible. The One Page Marketing Plan Get New Customers, Make More Money, and Stand Out from the Crowd. Written by Alan Dibb. Narrated by Joel Richards. Acknowledgements If I have seen further than others, it is by standing upon the shoulders of giants. Isaac Newton I wish I could tell you all the ideas in this book were my inventions, and that I'm some kind of marketing and business genius. The truth is, though, I'm a collector of elegant ideas. I rarely invent anything, and when I do, it's rarely worth writing about. An early business mentor of mine, Mal Emery, would often say, I've never had an original idea in my life. It's just too bloody dangerous. Yet he was, and continues to be, an extremely successful businessman and marketer. The secret of his success, and subsequently mine, was to just model things that were known to reliably work, rather than trying to reinvent the wheel. Reinventing the wheel requires you to be a genius, and even then, it carries with it a high probability of failure. I'm no genius, and I hate failing, so I prefer to just closely copy the things that made others successful, at least until I've got a very good handle on the basics. This tilts the odds in my favor and gives me a high probability of success. While I did create the system that has become the one-page marketing plan, many of the direct response marketing concepts that make it work are the inventions and ideas of other great business leaders and marketers. Perhaps I flatter myself, but the aphorism, good artists copy, great artists steal, repeated by Steve Jobs and attributed to Pablo Picasso, is certainly a philosophy I've held in mind when collecting these elegant ideas over the years and writing this book. Regardless of whether you consider me a great artist or a thief, I want you to benefit from the treasure trove of the proven business-building ideas that follow. Certainly, there's a place for creativity and invention, but in my opinion, this should come after you've first mastered the basics. This book contains many of those basics. Some come from my own experiences, but most come from people who've been giants in my business life and on whose shoulders I've stood. In no particular order, I'd like to acknowledge Mal Emery, Dean Jackson, Joe Polish, Pete Godfrey, Dan Kennedy, James Schramko, Jim Rohn, Frank Kern, Seth Godin. Some have been personal mentors to me, while others have been mentors to me through publications and other works they've produced. I try and credit them in footnotes throughout this book when, as far as I know, an idea I'm presenting has originated from them. However, I'm certain that I've left other people out or not acknowledged enough of the ideas of the people above. When you collect ideas over a period of many years, it can sometimes become a blur when trying to recall where one originated. For that, I apologize in advance. The one-page marketing plan is an implementation breakthrough rather than a new marketing innovation or concept. It's by far the easiest way for a small business to go from knowing nothing about marketing to creating and implementing a sophisticated direct response marketing plan in their business. The plan is literally reduced to a single page. Please enjoy the ideas in this book and, more importantly, implement them in your business. Remember, knowing and not doing is the same as not knowing. Important. This book is designed to be interactive. Today, there's a blurring of offline and online worlds. The days of a written book or e-book being nothing but text are long gone. Concepts are timeless, but with rapid changes in technology, the implementation of those concepts can change dramatically. It's my goal to help you understand both the timeless concepts and strategies in the one-page marketing plan, as well as give you access to the most up-to-date application of these concepts. For this reason, you'll find signposts along the way in this audiobook that will lead you to a special resources section of the one-page marketing plan website. These resources are exclusively available to listeners of this audiobook and are designed to go hand-in-hand hand with it. They include templates and samples of the one-page marketing plan, as well as links, videos, and articles referenced throughout this audiobook. Access these resources at marketingaudiobook.com. In some places throughout this audiobook, I refer to visual elements which are included in the print and digital versions of this book. 
As a special bonus to audiobook listeners, I've also included each of these visual elements for you in the special resources section of the One Page Marketing Plan website, which can be accessed at marketingaudiobook.com. Introduction What's this all about? If I had to summarize the essence of this book in one sentence, it would be The Fastest Path to the Money. I've purposely put this as early as humanly possible in the book because I don't want to waste your time. I know for a certainty that this opening sentence will be off-putting to a large number of people, and frankly, I'd much prefer they read someone else's business book full of ear-tickling cliches like follow your passion, work hard, hire the right people, blah, blah, blah. If that's what you're after, then search Amazon. There'll be a gazillion business books there for you on all these airy-fairy concepts, and much more, mostly written by professional authors and researchers who've never actually built a high-growth business. This book is blatantly and unashamedly about growing your business fast and reaping the rewards of that kind of success. Running out of oxygen really sucks. As Zig Ziglar famously said, Money isn't everything, but it ranks right up there with oxygen. Yep, nothing, nothing kills a business faster than a lack of oxygen, a.k.a. money. Why am I so unashamedly focused on the money getting? There are a few good reasons. Firstly, there's almost no business problem that can't be solved with more money, which is handy because almost every business I know of is full of problems. Money helps you solve the vast majority of things that make business a pain in the backside. Secondly, when you've taken care of yourself, you have a chance to help others. If you didn't go into business to make money, then you're either lying or you have a hobby, not a business. And yes, I know all about delivering value, changing the world, etc. But how much of that are you going to do if you're broke? How many people can you help? When you board an airplane and they're going through all the safety procedures, the airline attendant will inevitably get to a point that goes something like this. Should the cabin experience sudden pressure loss, oxygen masks will drop down from above your seat. Place the mask over your mouth and nose and pull the strap to tighten. If you are traveling with children or someone who requires assistance, make sure that your own mask is on first before helping others. Why fit your own mask before helping others? Because if you're slumped over your seat, suffering from a lack of oxygen, A, you can't help anyone else, and even worse, B, we now have to deploy scarce resources to come and help you, otherwise you'll soon be dead. Knowing What to Do In his book titled, The Book of Survival, Anthony Greenback wrote, To live through an impossible situation, you don't need to have the reflexes of a Grand Prix driver, the muscles of a Hercules, the mind of an Einstein. You simply need to know what to do. The statistics vary on exactly what percentage of businesses fail within the first five years. Some estimates put it as high as 90%. However, I've never seen this statistic being quoted as anything less than 50%. That means if we're being super optimistic, you have a 50-50 chance of still having your doors open after five years. However, here's where it really gets worse. The statistics only take into account businesses that completely cease trading. They don't take into account the businesses that plateau at a low level and slowly kill or make the lives of their owners miserable. Have you ever wondered why most small businesses plateau at a mediocre level? At one end of the spectrum, there's Pete the Plumber, who works 16-hour days, weekends, and never takes holidays while barely making enough to keep his head above water. On the other end of the spectrum, there's Joe, who runs a plumbing company with 20 plumbers working for him. It seems like his primary business activity is counting the huge sums of money that keep rolling in. It's very common for small businesses to never grow past the point at which they generate just enough profit for the owners to make a modest living. It seems that no matter how hard the owners try, their efforts to get to the next level just lead to frustration. At this point, one of two things happen. Either they get disillusioned, or they just accept their fate, that their business is nothing more than a low-paid, self-created job. 
In fact, the reality is that many business owners would probably be better off just finding a job in their industry. They would likely work fewer hours, have less stress, enjoy more benefits, and have more holiday time than in the prison they have created for themselves. On the flip side, there are a few business owners that just seem to have it all. They work reasonable hours, have a fantastic cash flow from their enterprise, and enjoy continuous growth. Many business owners who are struggling blame their industry. While it's true some industries are in decline, examples such as bookstores or video rental stores immediately come to mind. If you are in one of these dead or dying industries, it may be time to cut your losses and move on rather than torture yourself to death financially. This may be particularly difficult if you have been in the industry for a long time. However, for the most part, when people blame their industry, they are just playing the blame game. Some of the most common industry complaints I hear are, it's too competitive, the margins are too low, online discounters are taking customers away, advertising no longer works. However, it's rarely the industry that is truly to blame. After all, there are others in that same industry that are doing very well. So the obvious question is, what are they doing differently? Many small business owners fall into the trap described in Michael Gerber's classic book, The E-Myth. That is, they are a technician, for example, plumber, hairdresser, dentist, etc., and they are good at what they do. They have what Gerber describes as an entrepreneurial seizure, and they start to think to themselves, why should I work for this idiot boss of mine? I'm good at what I do. I'll start my own business. This is one of the major mistakes made by most small business owners. They go from working for an idiot boss to becoming an idiot boss. Here is the key point. Just because you're good at the technical thing you do doesn't mean that you're good at the business of what you do. So going back to our example, a good plumber is not necessarily the best person to run a plumbing business. This is a vitally important distinction to note and is a key reason that most small businesses fail. The owner of the business may have excellent technical skills, but it's his lack of business skills that causes his business to fail. This is not meant to discourage people from starting their own businesses. However, you must resolve to become good at the business of what you do, not just the technical thing you do. A business can be an amazing vehicle for achieving financial freedom and personal fulfillment, but only for those who understand and master this vital distinction and figure out what they need to do to run a successful business. If you are good at the technical thing of what you do, but feel like you could benefit from some help on the business side, then you're in the right place at the right time. The whole point of this book is to take you from confusion to clarity, so you know exactly what to do to have business success. Professionals Have Plans as a kid, my favorite TV show was The A-Team. In case you've never watched it, I'll give you the executive summary of 99% of the episodes. 1. Bad guys harass and threaten an innocent person or group. 2. The innocent person or group begs and pleads with the A-Team to help them. 3. The A-Team, a motley bunch of ex-soldiers, fight, humiliate, and drive away the bad guys. Episodes would invariably end with Hannibal, the brains of the A-Team, chomping down on his cigar and triumphantly mumbling, I love it when a plan comes together. Look at any profession where the stakes are high and you'll see a well-thought-out plan being followed. Professionals never just wing it. Doctors follow a treatment plan. Airline pilots follow a flight plan. Soldiers follow a military operation plan. How would you feel about engaging the services of any of the above professions where the practitioner says to you, screw the plan, I'll just wing it? Yet this is exactly what most business owners do. Invariably, when someone makes a mess of something, it often becomes clear in the aftermath that they didn't have a plan. Don't let that be you and your business. While no one can guarantee your success, having a plan dramatically increases your probability of success. Just like you wouldn't want to be in a plane where the pilot hadn't bothered with a flight plan, you don't want you and your family relying on a business where you hadn't bothered with a business plan. Often the stakes are almost as high. 
marriages, partnerships, jobs, and more are often the casualties of failed businesses. It's more than just your ego on the line, so it's time to go pro and create a plan. The Wrong Kind of Plan Early into my first business, I was smart enough to identify that a business plan was going to be important to my success. Unfortunately, that's where my smarts ended. With the help of a business consultant, who'd never actually run a successful business of his own, I ended up many thousands of dollars poorer, but had a document that most business owners never bother with, a business plan. My business plan was many hundreds of pages long. It had graphs, charts, projections, and much, much more. It was an awesome-looking document, but essentially was a bunch of nonsense. After it was written, I shoved it in the top drawer of my desk and never saw it again until the day we were moving offices and I had to clean out my desk. I dusted it off, flicked through it, and tossed it in the trash, angry at myself about the money I'd wasted on that phony baloney consultant. However, later, when I thought about it more carefully, I realized while the document itself was a bunch of nonsense, the process I went through with the consultant was valuable in clarifying some of the key elements in my business, particularly one key section of it called the marketing plan. In fact, a lot of what we did to create the marketing plan shaped the business and created much of our future success. More on this in a moment, but for now, let me introduce a man and his concept that's going to be the key to your business success. My friend, Vilfredo Pareto, and the 80-20 rule. I never had the privilege of meeting Vilfredo Pareto, mostly because he died over a half century before I was born, but I'm sure we would have been best buds. Pareto was an Italian economist who noticed that 80% of the land in Italy was owned by 20% of the population. Hence, the Pareto Principle, commonly known as the 80-20 rule, was born. It turns out the 80-20 rule holds true for more than just land ownership in Italy. It holds true for almost anything you care to think of. Some examples, 80% of a company's profits come from 20% of its customers. 80% of road traffic accidents are caused by 20% of drivers. 80% of software usage is by 20% of users. 80% of a company's complaints come from 20% of its customers. 80% of wealth is owned by 20% of people. Woody Allen even noted that 80% of success is showing up. In other words, the Pareto Principle predicts that 80% of effects come from 20% of causes. Maybe it's just my laziness talking, but this gets me seriously excited. It's often said that necessity is the mother of invention, but I'd argue that laziness is, and my friend Vilfredo is my mentor in that pursuit. So essentially, you can cut out 80% of the stuff you're doing, sit on the couch eating nachos instead, and you'll still get most of the result you're getting. If you don't want to sit on the couch chowing down on nachos 80% of the time, then doing more of the 20% stuff is your fast track to success. And in this context, success is defined as making more money while doing less work. The 64-4 Rule if you think the 80-20 rule is exciting, the 64-4 rule will blow your mind. You see, we can apply the 80-20 rule to the rule itself. So we take 80% of 80 and 20% of 20 and end up with the 64-4 rule. So, 64% of effects come from 4% of causes. Put another way, the majority of your success comes from the top 4% of your actions. Put yet another way, 96% of the stuff you do is a waste of time, comparatively. The most surprising thing is that the 80-20 rule and 64-4 rule still hold up in a remarkably accurate way. If you look at wealth distribution statistics from the last century, you'll notice that the top 4% own about 64% of the wealth and the top 20% own about 80% of the wealth. This is despite this being the information age. 
You'd imagine that a hundred years ago only the wealthy had good access to information. Hence, it's understandable why they held 80% of the wealth. Yet this wealth distribution statistic still holds up today, an age where information has been democratized and where even the poorest people have pretty much the same access to information as the wealthiest people. This proves that lack of information isn't the issue holding back the bottom 80% of business owners. It's human behavior and mindset. That certainly hasn't changed in the last hundred years. The Best Kept Secret of the Rich In my observation of and work with numerous business owners around the world, there's one thing that differentiates the wildly successful and wealthy ones from the struggling and broke. Struggling business owners will spend time to save money, whereas successful business owners will spend money to save time. Why is that an important distinction? Because you can always get more money, but you can never get more time. So you need to ensure the stuff you spend your time on makes the biggest impact. This is called leverage, and leverage is the best-kept secret of the rich. These big-impacting, leveraged activities are the things that make up the key 20% of the 80-20 rule and the 4% of the 64-4 rule. If you want more success, you need to start paying attention to and expand the things that give you the most leverage. There are various areas of your business where you could start looking for leverage points. You may look at getting 50% better at your negotiation skills. This, in turn, may help you renegotiate with key suppliers and get an incremental improvement in your buy price. While this is great, at the end of the day, after all that time and effort, you've still just improved your bottom line incrementally. This is not what I'd call massive leverage. We want exponential improvement, not incremental. By far the biggest leverage point in any business is marketing. If you get 10% better at marketing, this can have an exponential or multiplying effect on your bottom line. Willie Sutton was a prolific American bank robber. During his 40-year criminal career, he stole millions of dollars and eventually spent more than half of his adult life in prison and also managed to escape three times. Sutton was asked by reporter Mitch Onstad why he robbed banks. According to Onstad, he replied, Because that's where the money is. When it comes to business, the reason we want to focus so heavily on marketing is the same. Because that's where the money is. Applying the 80-20 and 64-4 rules. Your marketing plan. Back to my earlier story about the wrong type of business plan. While my business plan document ended up being a useless mess of management speak and nonsense, the part of the business planning process that proved hugely valuable to me was creating the marketing plan. The marketing plan ended up being the 20% of the business planning process that produced 80% of the result. This has been the case in every business I've started and run since then. With this in mind, when I started coaching small business owners, a large part of my focus was getting them to create a marketing plan. Guess what? Very few of them ever carried through with it. Why? Because creating a marketing plan was a complex, laborious process which most small business owners simply won't do. So again, laziness becomes the mother of invention. I needed a way to take the core essence of the marketing planning process and make it simple, practical, and useful to small business owners. The one-page marketing plan was born. The one-page marketing plan is the 4% of effort that generates 64% or more of the result in your business. It's the 64-4 rule applied to business planning. Using this process, we can boil down hundreds of pages and thousands of hours of traditional business planning into a single page, which can take as little as 30 minutes to think about and fill in. Even more exciting is that it becomes a living document in your business, one that you can stick on the wall of your office and refer to and refine over time. Most of all, it's practical. There's no management speak or jargon to understand. You don't need an MBA to create it or understand it. 
the one-page marketing plan has been a marketing implementation breakthrough. I've seen compliance rates among coaching clients significantly improve. Small business owners who would have never had the time, money, or know-how to create a traditional marketing plan now have one. As a result, they've reaped the massive benefits that come from having clarity around their marketing. I'll introduce the one-page marketing plan shortly, but first I think it would be valuable to start at the beginning and not assume anything. Marketing itself is a vague term which is poorly understood even by so-called professionals and experts in the industry. So let's quickly get a quick and simple understanding of what marketing actually is. What is marketing? Some people think marketing is advertising or branding or some other vague concept. While all of these are associated with marketing, they are not one and the same. Here's the simplest, most jargon-free definition of marketing you're ever likely to come across. If the circus is coming to town and you paint a sign saying, Circus coming to the showground Saturday, that's advertising. If you put the sign on the back of an elephant and walk it into town, that's promotion. If the elephant walks through the mayor's flower bed and the local newspaper writes a story about it, that's publicity. And if you get the mayor to laugh about it, that's public relations. If the town's citizens go to the circus, you show them the many entertainment booths, explain how much fun they'll have spending money at the booths, answer their questions, and ultimately, they spend a lot at the circus, that's sales. And if you plan the whole thing, that's marketing. Yep, it's as simple as that. Marketing is the strategy you use for getting your ideal target market to know you, like you, and trust you enough to become a customer. All the stuff you usually associate with marketing are tactics. We'll talk more about strategy versus tactics in a moment. However, before we do that, you need to understand a fundamental shift has occurred in the last decade, and things will never be the same. The answers have changed. Albert Einstein was once giving an exam paper to his graduating class. It turned out that it was the exact same exam paper he had given them the previous year. His teaching assistant, alarmed at what he saw and thinking it to be the result of the professor's absent-mindedness, alerted Einstein. Excuse me, sir, said the shy assistant, not quite sure how to tell the great man about his blunder. Yes, said Einstein. Um, eh, it's about the test you just handed out. Einstein waited patiently. I'm not sure if you realize it, but this is the same test you gave out last year. In fact, it's identical. Einstein paused to think for a moment, then said, Yes, it is the same test, but the answers have changed. Just as the answers in physics change as new discoveries are made, so too do the answers in business and in marketing. Once upon a time, you placed an ad in the yellow pages, paid them a truckload of money, and your marketing for the year was done. Now you have Google, social media, blogs, websites, and a myriad of other things to think about. The Internet has literally opened up a world of competitors. Whereas previously your competitors may have been across the road, now they can be on the other side of the globe. As a result of this, many who are trying to market their business become paralyzed by the bright, shiny object syndrome. This is where they get caught up in whatever the currently hot marketing tactics are, like SEO, video, podcasting, pay-per-click advertising, etc. They get caught up with tools and tactics and never figure out the big picture of what they're trying to actually do and why. Let me show you why this will lead to a world of pain. Strategy versus Tactics Understanding the difference between strategy and tactics is absolutely key to marketing success. Strategy is the big-picture planning you do prior to the tactics. Imagine you bought an empty block of land and want to build a house. Would you just order a pile of bricks and then just start laying them? Of course not. You'd end up with a big old mess that likely wasn't safe. So what do you do instead? You hire a builder and an architect first, and they plan everything out from the major stuff like getting building permits down to what kind of tap fittings you'd like. 
All of this is planned prior to a single shovel of dirt being moved. That's strategy. Then once you have your strategy, you know how many bricks you need, where the foundation goes, and what kind of roof you're going to have. Now you can hire a bricklayer, carpenter, plumber, electrician, etc. That's tactics. You can't do anything worthwhile successfully without both strategy and tactics. Strategy without tactics leads to paralysis by analysis. No matter how good the builder and the architect are, the house isn't going to get built until someone starts laying bricks. At some stage, they're going to need to say, Okay, the blueprint is now good, we've got all the necessary approvals to build, so let's get started. Tactics without strategy leads to the bright shiny object syndrome. Imagine you started building a wall without any plans and then later found out that it was in the wrong place, so you start pouring the foundation, and then you find out it's not right for this type of house, so you start excavating the area where you want the pool, but that isn't right either. This clearly isn't going to work. Yet this is exactly how many business owners do marketing. They string together a bunch of random tactics in the hope that what they're doing will lead to a customer. They whack up a website without much thought, and it ends up being an online version of their brochure. Or they start promoting on social media because they heard that's the latest thing, and so on. You need both strategy and tactics to be successful, but strategy must come first, and it dictates the tactics you use. This is where your marketing plan comes in. Think of your marketing plan as the architect's blueprint for getting and retaining customers. I have a great product slash service. Do I really need marketing? Many business owners fool themselves into thinking that if their product is excellent, the market will buy. While, if you build it, they will come, makes a great movie plot, it's a terrible business strategy. It's a strategy that's expensive and comes with a high rate of failure. History is littered with technically superior products that commercially failed. A few examples include Betamax, the Newton, and Laserdisc, to name just a few. Good, even great products are simply not enough. Marketing must be one of your major activities if you're to have business success. Ask yourself, when does a prospect find out how good your product or service is? The answer, of course, is when they buy. If they don't buy, they'll never know how good your products or services are. As Thomas Watson from IBM famously said, nothing happens until a sale is made. Therefore, we need to clearly understand an important concept. A good product or service is a customer retention tool. If we give our customers a great product or service experience, they'll buy more from us, they'll refer other people to us, and build up the brand through positive word of mouth. However, before customer retention, we need to think about customer acquisition, a.k.a. marketing. The most successful entrepreneurs always start with marketing. How to Kill Your Business I'm about to reveal to you one of the easiest and most common ways to kill your business, in the earnest hope that you won't do it. It's absolutely the biggest mistake made by small business owners when it comes to marketing. It's a widespread problem, and it's at the heart of why most small business marketing fails. If you're a small business owner, you've no doubt given some thought to marketing and advertising. What approach are you going to take? What are you going to say in your advertising? The most common way most small business owners decide on this is by looking at large, successful competitors and their industry and mimicking what they're doing. This seems logical. Do what other successful businesses are doing, and you will also become successful. Right? In reality, this is the fastest way to fail, and I'm certain it's responsible for the bulk of small business failures. Here are the two major reasons why. Number one. Large companies have a different agenda. Large companies have a very different agenda when it comes to marketing than small businesses do. Their strategies and priorities differ from yours significantly. The marketing priorities of a large company look something like this. 1. Pleasing the board of directors. 2. Appeasing shareholders. 3. Satisfying superiors' biases. 4. Satisfying existing clients' preconceptions. 5. 
winning advertising and creative awards. 6. Getting buy-in from various committees and stakeholders. 7. Making a profit. The marketing priorities of a small business owner look something like this. 1. Making a profit. As you can see, there is a world of difference in the marketing priorities of small and large companies. So naturally, there would have to be a world of difference in strategy and execution. Number 2. Large companies have a very different budget. Strategy changes with scale. This is very important to understand. Do you think someone investing in and building skyscrapers has a different property investment strategy than the average small property investor? Of course. Using the same strategy simply won't work on a small scale. You can't just build one floor of a skyscraper and have a success. You need all 100 stories. If you have an advertising budget of $10 million and three years to get a profitable result, then you're going to use a very different strategy compared to someone needing to make a profit immediately with a $10,000 budget. Using a large company marketing strategy, your $10,000 is going to be a drop in the ocean. It will be totally wasted and ineffective because you're using the wrong strategy for the scale that you're operating at. Large Company Marketing Large company marketing is also sometimes known as mass marketing or branding. The goal of this type of advertising is to remind customers and prospects about your brand as well as the products and services you offer. The idea is that the more times you run ads from your brand, the more likely people are to have this brand at the top of their consciousness when they go to make a purchasing decision. The vast majority of large company marketing falls into this category. If you've seen the ads from major brands such as Coca-Cola, Nike, and Apple, you'll have experienced mass marketing. This type of marketing is effective. However, it is very expensive to successfully pull off and takes a lot of time. It requires you to saturate various types of advertising media, for example, TV, print, radio, internet, etc., on a very regular basis and over an extended period of time. The expense and time involved are not a problem for the major brands as they have massive advertising budgets, teams of marketing people, and product lines are planned years in advance. However, a major problem arises when small businesses try to imitate the big brands at this type of marketing. The few times they run their ads is like a drop in the ocean. It's nowhere near enough to reach the consciousness of their target market who are bombarded with thousands of marketing messages each day. So they get drowned out and see little or no return for their investment. Another advertising victim bites the dust. It's not that the small businesses aren't good at branding or mass media ads. It's that they simply don't have the budget to run their ads in sufficient volume to make them effective. Unless you have millions of dollars in your marketing budget, you have a very high probability of failure with this type of marketing. Branding, mass marketing, and ego-based marketing is the domain of large companies. To achieve any kind of cut-through requires an enormous budget and the use of expensive mass media. Following the path of other successful businesses is smart, but it's vital that you understand the full strategy you're following and that you're able to execute it. Strategy from an outside observer's perspective can be very different to the reality. If you're following a strategy that has different priorities to you or has a vastly different budget, then it's highly unlikely it will generate the kind of result you're hoping for. Now, let's look at what successful small to medium business marketing looks like. Small and medium business marketing Direct response marketing is a particular branch of marketing that gives small businesses cut-through and a competitive edge on a small budget. It's designed to ensure you get a return on investment that is measurable. If $10 bills were being sold for $2 each, how many would you buy? As many as you could get your hands on naturally. The name of the game with direct response marketing is money at a discount. For example, for every $2 spent on advertising, you get $10 out in the way of profits from sales. It's also a highly ethical way of selling. It's focused on the specific problems of the prospect and aims to solve these problems with education and specific solutions. It is also the only real way for a small business to affordably reach the consciousness of a prospect. 
When you turn your ads into direct response ads, they become lead-generating tools rather than just name recognition tools. Direct response marketing is designed to evoke an immediate response and compel prospects to take some specific action, such as opting into your email list, picking up the phone and calling for more information, placing an order, or being directed to a web page. So what makes a direct response ad? Here are some of the main characteristics. It's trackable. That is, when someone responds, you know which ad and which media was responsible for generating the response. This is in direct contrast to mass media or brand marketing. No one will ever know what ad compelled you to buy that can of Coke. Heck, you may not even know yourself. It's measurable. Since you know which ads are being responded to and how many sales you've received from each one, you can measure exactly how effective each ad is. You then drop or change ads that are not giving you a return on investment. It uses compelling headlines and sales copy. Direct response marketing has a compelling message of strong interest to your chosen prospects. It uses attention-grabbing headlines with strong sales copy that is salesmanship in print. Often the ad looks more like an editorial than an ad, hence making it at least three times more likely to get read. It targets a specific audience or niche. Prospects within specific verticals, geographic zones, or niche markets are targeted. The ad aims to appeal to a narrow target market. It makes a specific offer. Usually the ad makes a specific value-packed offer. Often the aim is not necessarily to sell anything from the ad, but to simply get the prospect to take the next action, such as requesting a free report. The offer focuses on the prospect rather than on the advertiser and talks about the prospect's interests, desires, fears, and frustrations. By contrast, mass media or brand marketing has a broad, one-size-fits-all marketing message and is focused on the advertiser. It demands a response. Direct response advertising has a call-to-action, compelling the prospect to do something specific. It also includes a means of response and capture of these responses. Interested, high-probability prospects have easy ways to respond, such as a regular phone number, a free recorded message line, a website, a fax back form, a reply card, or coupons. When the prospect responds, as much of the person's contact information as possible is captured so that they can be contacted beyond the initial response. Multi-step, short-term follow-up. In exchange for capturing the prospect's details, valuable education and information on the prospect's problem is offered. The information should carry with it a second, irresistible offer tied to whatever next step you want the prospect to take, such as calling to schedule an appointment or coming into the showroom or store. Then a series of follow-up touches via different media such as mail, email, fax, and phone are made. Often there is a time or quantity limit on the offer. Maintenance Follow-Up of Unconverted Leads People who do not respond within the short-term follow-up period may have many reasons for not maturing into buyers immediately. There is value in this bank of slow-to-mature prospects. They should be nurtured and continue hearing from you regularly. Direct response marketing is a very deep topic with many facets. The one-page marketing plan is a tool that helps you implement direct response marketing in your business without needing to spend years studying to become an expert. It's a guided process that helps you create the key elements of a direct response campaign for your business quickly and easily. The One-Page Marketing Plan The One-Page Marketing Plan template is designed so that you can fill it in, in point form as you listen to this audiobook, and end up with a personalized marketing plan for your business. There are nine squares split up into three major phases of the marketing process. Most great plays, movies, and books are split up into a three-act structure, and so too is good marketing. Let's take a look into these three acts. The Three Phases of the Marketing Journey The marketing process is a journey we want to guide our ideal target market through. We want to guide them from not knowing we exist right through to being a raving fan customer. Through this journey, there are three distinct phases that we guide them through. These phases are the before, during, and after phases of your marketing process. 
The following is a brief overview of each of these phases. Before. We label people going through the before phase as prospects. At the beginning of the before phase, prospects typically don't even know you exist. The successful completion of this phase results in the prospect knowing who you are and indicating interest. Example. Tom is a busy business owner and is frustrated that he can't keep his contacts in sync between his laptop and smartphone. He searches online for a solution and comes across an ad with the headline, Five Little-Known Strategies That Unlock the Power of Your Business IT System. Tom clicks on the ad and is taken to an online form where he must enter his email address in order to download a free report. Tom sees value in what the report has to offer, so he enters his email address. During We label people going through the during phase as leads. At the beginning of the during phase, leads have indicated some interest in your offer. The successful completion of this phase results in the prospect buying from you for the first time. Example Tom gets a lot of value from the report he downloaded. It has some genuinely good tips that he didn't previously know and implementing them has saved him a lot of time. In addition, the IT company that wrote the report has been emailing him additional valuable tips and information and offers Tom a free 21-point IT audit for his business. Tom takes them up on this offer. The audit is thorough and professional and reveals to Tom that his IT systems are vulnerable because a lot of the software on his computers is out of date. Also, the backups he thought were happening actually stopped working six months ago. They offer Tom a heavily discounted offer where they'll send a technician to fix all the problems identified during the audit. Tom takes them up on this offer. After We label people in this phase as customers. At the beginning of the after phase, customers have already given you money. The after phase never ends, and when executed correctly, results in a virtuous cycle where the customer buys from you repeatedly and is such a fan of your products or services that they consistently recommend you and introduce you to new prospects. Example. Tom is extremely impressed with the professionalism of the technician that came in and fixed his IT problems. The technician was on time, courteous, and explained everything to Tom in plain English. Importantly, he follows through on his company's promise of fixed first time or it's free. Someone from headquarters follows up with Tom the next day to ensure he's satisfied with the service he received. Tom indicates that he is very satisfied. During this follow-up call, Tom is offered a maintenance package where a qualified technician will look after his IT systems for a fixed monthly fee. It also includes unlimited technical support, so if Tom is stuck at any time, he can call a toll-free number and get immediate help. Tom takes up this offer. The support line alone is of huge value to him as he frequently gets frustrated with his IT system and loses productive time trying to figure out a fix. Tom even refers three of his business friends from his golf club to this company because of the great service he's experienced. In summary, if we were to describe the three phases in table form, it would look like this. Phase, before, status, prospect, goal of this phase, Get them to know you and indicate interest. Phase during, status, lead. Goal of this phase, get them to like you and buy from you for the first time. Phase after, status, customer. Goal of this phase, get them to trust you, buy from you regularly, and refer new business to you. Now that we've got a good bird's eye view of the overall structure, it's time to dive in and look in depth at each of the nine squares that make up your one-page marketing plan. Important. Download your copy of the one-page marketing plan template at marketingaudiobook.com. Act 1. The Before Phase. The Before Phase Section Summary. In the before phase, you're dealing with prospects. Prospects are people that may not even know you exist. In this phase, you'll identify a target market, craft a compelling message for this target market, and deliver your message to them through advertising media. The goal of this phase is to get your prospect to know you and respond to your message. Once they've indicated interest by responding, they become a lead and enter the second phase of your marketing process.
Chapter 1. Selecting Your Target Market Chapter 1 Summary Selecting your target market is a crucial first step in the marketing process. Doing so will ensure your marketing message resonates better, which in turn will make your marketing far more effective. By focusing on the right target market for your business, you'll be able to get a better return on the time, money, and energy you invest. Highlights covered in this chapter include why targeting everyone with your product or service is a terrible idea, why mass marketing can be harmful to your business and cost you far more than it makes you, how to use the PVP index to select your perfect target market, why you should focus on a niche and become a big fish in a small pond, how to make price irrelevant, why you should stop advertising a long list of products and services, how to go deep into the mind of your prospect so you can understand exactly what they want. It's not everyone. When I ask business owners who their target market is, many tend to respond with everyone. In reality, this means no one. In their zeal to acquire as many customers as possible, many business owners try to serve the widest market possible. On the face of it, this seems logical. However, it's actually a huge mistake. Many business owners worry about narrowing down their target market because they don't want to exclude any potential customers. This is a typical newbie marketing mistake. In this chapter, we're going to examine why excluding customers is actually a good thing. As discussed in the previous chapter, most large company advertising falls into a category called mass marketing, sometimes also referred to as branding. With this type of marketing, business owners are like an archer in the middle of a dense fog, shooting arrows in every direction in the hope that one or more of them will hit the intended target. The theory behind mass marketing is that you want to get your name out there. I'm not really sure exactly where there is or what's supposed to happen when your name arrives there. Regardless, the theory is that if you broadcast your message enough times, you'll by chance get an audience with your prospects and some percentage of them will buy from you. If that sounds a lot like our disoriented archer, flailing about in the fog, shooting his arrows in random directions and hoping for the best, then you'd be right. However, you might be thinking, if he just shoots enough arrows in all directions, surely he's bound to hit his target, right? Maybe, but for small to medium-sized businesses at least, that's the stupid way of marketing, because they'll never have enough arrows, i.e. money, to hit their target enough times to get a good return on their investment. To be a successful small business marketer, you need laser-like focus on a narrow target market, sometimes called a niche. Niching, harnessing the power of focus. Before going any further, let's define what a business niche is. A niche is a tightly defined portion of a subcategory. For example, think of the health and beauty category. This is a very wide category. A beauty salon can offer a wide variety of services, including tanning, waxing, facials, massage, cellulite treatment, and much more. If, for example, we take one of these subcategories, let's say cellulite treatment, this could be our niche. However, we could tighten it up even further by focusing on cellulite treatment for women who've just had a baby. This is a tightly defined niche. Now, you may be thinking, why on earth would we want to limit our market so much? Here's why. 1. You have a limited amount of money. If you focus too broadly, your marketing message will become diluted and weak. 2. The other critical factor is relevance. The goal of your ad is for your prospects to say, hey, that's for me. If you're a woman who's just had a baby and are concerned about cellulite, would an ad targeting this specific problem grab your interest? Most certainly. How about if the ad was a general ad for a beauty salon which reeled off a long list of services, one of which was cellulite treatment? Likely, it would get missed in the clutter. A 100-watt light bulb, like the kind of light bulb we normally have in our homes, lights up a room. By contrast, a 100-watt laser can cut through steel. Same energy, dramatically different result. The difference being how the energy is focused. 
The exact same thing is true of your marketing. Take another example of a photographer. If you look at ads from most photographers, you'll see a laundry list of services like portraits, weddings, family photography, commercial photography, fashion photography, etc. The technical way photography is done may not change very much from situation to situation, but let me ask you a question. Do you think someone looking for wedding photography would respond to a different ad than someone who's after commercial photography? Do you think a bride-to-be looking for a photographer for her special day might be looking for something radically different than a purchasing manager from a heavy machinery distributor looking to photograph a truck for a product brochure? Of course. However, if the ad just rolls out a broad laundry list of services, then it's not speaking to either prospect, therefore it's not relevant, therefore it will likely be ignored by both market segments. That's why you need to choose a narrow target market for your marketing campaign. Being all things to all people leads to marketing failure. This doesn't mean you can't offer a broad range of services, but understand that each category of service is a separate campaign. Targeting a tight niche allows you to become a big fish in a small pond. It allows you to dominate a category or geography in a way that is impossible by being general. The type of niches that you want to go after are an inch wide and a mile deep. An inch wide meaning it is a highly targeted subsection of a category. A mile deep meaning there's a lot of people looking for a solution to that specific problem. Once you dominate one niche, you can expand your business by finding another profitable and highly targeted niche, then dominate that one also. Now you can have all the advantages of being highly targeted without limiting the potential size of your business. Niching makes price irrelevant. If you had just suffered a heart attack, would you prefer to be treated by a general doctor or a heart specialist? Of course, you choose the specialist. Now, if you had a consultation with a heart specialist, would you expect them to charge you more than a general doctor? Of course. Your bill with a specialist would likely be much higher than with your general practitioner, yet you're not shopping on price. How did price suddenly become irrelevant? That is the beauty of serving a niche. Whether you do heart surgery or offer cellulite treatment, you can now charge far more for your services than by being a generalist. You're perceived differently by your prospects and customers. A specialist is sought after rather than shopped on price. A specialist is much more highly respected than a jack-of-all-trades. A specialist is paid handsomely to solve a specific problem for their target market. So figure out the one thing your market wants a solution to, something that they'll pay you handsomely for. Then enter the conversation they're having in their mind, preferably something they go to bed worrying about, and wake up thinking about. Do this and your results will dramatically improve. Trying to target everyone in reality means you're targeting no one. By going too broad, you kill your specialness and become a commodity bought on price. By narrowly defining a target market that you can wow and deliver huge results for, you become a specialist. When you narrow down your target market, you naturally decide who you're going to exclude. Don't underestimate the importance of this. Excluding potential customers scares many small business owners. They mistakenly believe that a wider net is more likely to capture more customers. This is a huge mistake. Dominate a niche. Then, once you own it, do the same with another and then another. But never do so all at once. Doing so dilutes your message and your marketing power. How to Identify Your Ideal Customer Given that you've now seen the power of choosing a narrow target market, it's time to select yours. As with most businesses, you may currently serve multiple market segments. For example, back to our photographer friend, he might do weddings, corporate photography, photojournalism, family portraits. These are vastly different market segments. A great way of figuring out your ideal market segment is to use the PVP index, personal fulfillment, value to the marketplace, and profitability, and giving each market segment you serve a rating out of 10. P. Personal Fulfillment How much do you enjoy dealing with this type of customer? Sometimes we work with pain-in-the-butt type customers just because of the money. 
Here you rate how much you enjoy working with this market segment. V. Value to the marketplace. How much does this market segment value your work? Are they willing to pay a lot of money for your work? P. Profitability. How profitable is the work you do for this market segment? Sometimes, even when you are charging high fees for your work, when you look at the numbers, it may be barely profitable or even loss making. Remember, it's not about the turnover, it's all about the leftover. For our photographer example, his PVP index may look as follows Weddings, Personal Fulfillment, 5, Value to the Marketplace, 7, Profits, 9, Total Score, 21, Photojournalism, Personal Fulfillment, 9, Value to the Marketplace, 7, Profits, 2, Total Score, 18, Corporate Photography, Personal Fulfillment, 3, Value to the Marketplace, 6, Profits, 9, Total Score, 18, Family Portraits, Personal Fulfillment, 9, Value to the Marketplace, 8, Profits, 9, Total Score, 26. The ideal customer for the photographer is people wanting family portraits. They are the most fun, most profitable, highest value, and best paying types of customers. There's likely to be a standout market segment for you, too. This doesn't mean that you can't take on work outside your ideal target market. However, for now, our marketing efforts will be directed at one ideal market segment. We want to be laser-focused. Once we dominate this market segment, we can go on and add others. If we are too broad initially and target a laundry list of market segments, then our marketing efforts will be ineffective. Who is your ideal target market? Be as specific as possible about all the attributes that may be relevant. What is their gender, age, geography? Do you have a picture of them? If so, cut out or print a picture of them when you think about and answer the following questions. What keeps them awake at night? Indigestion boiling up in their esophagus, eyes open, staring at the ceiling. What are they afraid of? What are they angry about? Who are they angry at? What are their top daily frustrations? What trends are occurring and will occur in their businesses or lives? What do they secretly, ardently desire most? Is there a built-in bias to the way they make decisions? For example, engineers are exceptionally analytical. Do they have their own language or jargon they use? What magazines do they read? What websites do they visit? What's this person's day like? What's the main dominant emotion this market feels? What is the one thing they crave above all else? These questions are not theoretical, pie-in-the-sky questions. They are absolutely key to your marketing success. Unless you can get into the mind of your prospect, all your other marketing efforts will be wasted, no matter how well you execute. Unless you belong to your target market, then a large part of your initial marketing efforts should be directed to in-depth research, interviews, and careful study of your target market. Create an Avatar One of the best tools for getting into the mind of your prospect is to temporarily become them by creating an avatar. Don't worry, I'm not going to get all woo-woo on you here. An avatar is a detailed exploration and description of your target customer and their lives. Like a police sketch artist, you piece together a composite which creates a vivid picture of them in your mind. It helps tell their story so you can visualize life from their perspective. It's also important to create avatars for each type of decision maker or influencer you might encounter in your target market. For example, if you're selling IT services to small companies in the financial services industry, you might be dealing with both the business owner and their assistant. Here's an example of avatars for Max Cash, the owner of a successful financial planning firm and his personal assistant, Angela Assistant. Max Cash. Max is 51 years old. He owns a successful financial planning business which has grown steadily over the past 10 years. Previously, he had a career working for KPMG and some other large corporates before he went out on his own. He has a bachelor's degree and an MBA. He's married and has two teenage daughters and a younger son. He lives in an upper-middle-class suburb in a five-bedroom house, which he's been in for about four years. 
He drives a two-year-old Mercedes S-Class. He has 18 staff members and operates from an office building which he owns. His office is a 15-minute drive from home. The business has an annual turnover of $4.5 million, which is predominantly service-based revenue. He has no IT support person on staff and delegates most of the IT and tech responsibilities to his PA, Angela Assistant. He spends about $4,000 per month on the various pieces of software used in his industry, which give him access to the most current financial data. He knows the software helps him and his clients, but he also knows that there are many features that are going underutilized. His office server and systems are a hodgepodge of various computers, mostly installed by his software vendors and which have had very little maintenance since installation. The backup systems are archaic and have never actually been tested. He's a golf nut. His office is decorated with golf memorabilia. There are photos of him playing golf throughout. The desktop background on his computer is a beautiful panoramic photo of Pebble Beach golf links. In his spare time, unsurprisingly, he likes to play golf with his friends and business associates. He reads the Wall Street Journal, Bloomberg Business Week, and his local newspaper. He uses an iPhone, but it's mostly used for phone calls and a little bit of email. See how this can give us a valuable insight into what the life of our prospect looks like? Now let's look at the avatar for another influencer within our target market. Angela Assistant Angela is 29 years old. She's single and lives in a two-bedroom rented apartment with her cat Sprinkles. She takes public transport to work and commutes daily for about 30 minutes. Angela is organized, always smartly dressed, and very enthusiastic. Angela has been working for Max as his PA for the last three years when the growth of the company had really started to accelerate. She's his right hand, and he'd be totally lost without her. She organizes Max's calendar, sets up his laptop and phone, makes and takes calls on his behalf, and much, much more. She's the glue that holds Max's business together, and she does a bit of everything from ordering stationery to IT to HR. Although her title says PA, she's more than that. She's really the office manager and probably even to some extent the general manager. She's the one that staff go to when something needs to be fixed, ordered, or organized. She's tech-savvy but really out of her depth when it comes to the more technical and strategic aspects of IT systems. After work, she usually hits the gym for a workout and loves to watch new shows on Netflix. On weekends, she catches up with friends and loves the nightlife. She spends a lot of time online reading beauty, fashion, and celebrity gossip blogs. Angela spends most of her discretionary income on going out, entertainment, and online shopping, which is like an addiction for her. Even though Angela is quite well paid, she always runs short of money, which has resulted in her having about $10,000 worth of credit card debt. She knows she needs to be better with money, but there always just seems to be too many temptations for her to resist. She's always glued to her phone, constantly texting and using social media apps. To take a step further, find an actual image to visually represent your avatar and have it in front of you whenever you're creating marketing material for them. Hopefully by now you can see how powerful avatars are. They are the marketing equivalent of method acting. They get you right into the mind of your prospect, which is going to be absolutely crucial when it comes to crafting your message to your target market. Chapter 1 Action Item Who is your target market? Fill in square number 1 of your one-page marketing plan. Chapter 2 Crafting Your Message Chapter 2 Summary most marketing messages are boring, timid, and ineffective. To stand out from the crowd, you need to craft a compelling message that grabs the attention of your target market. Once you have their attention, the goal of your message is to compel them to respond. Highlights covered in this chapter include why most advertising is totally useless and what to do instead, how to stand out from the crowd even when you're selling a commodity, why you should never compete solely on price, how to craft a compelling offer for your target market, examples of some of the most successful advertising headlines in history, how to enter the mind of your prospect and join the conversation going on in there, how to effectively name your business, product, or service.
An accident waiting to happen. I spend a lot of time looking through various forms of local and national media, not for articles, but for advertisements. Having done this for several years, with very few exceptions, I'm absolutely amazed how boring, similar, and useless most advertising is. The waste going on is staggering. Wasted money and wasted opportunity. You could summarize the structure of most ads from small businesses as follows. Company name. Company logo. A laundry list of services offered. Claims of best quality, best service, or best prices. Offer of a free quote. Contact details. It's basically name, rank, and serial number. Then they hope and pray that on the very day their ad runs, a prospect in immediate need of their product or service stumbles across it and takes action. This is what I call marketing by accident. A qualified prospect happening upon the right ad at the right time sometimes results in the happy accident of a sale taking place. If these accidents never happen, then no one would ever advertise. But as it happens, the occasional random sale or lead will come from this type of advertising. It tortures business owners to death because while the ad generally loses them money, they fear not running it because some dribs and drabs of new business have come from it. And who knows? Next week it may bring in that big sale they've been hoping for. It's like these businesses are visiting a slot machine in a casino. They put their money in, pull the handle, and hope for a jackpot. But most of the time, the house just takes their money. Occasionally, they'll get a few cents on the dollar back, which raises their hopes and emboldens them to continue. It's time to start marketing on purpose, treating advertising like a vending machine where the results and value generated are predictable, rather than like a slot machine where the results are random and the odds are stacked against you. To start marketing on purpose, we need to look at two vital elements. One, what is the purpose of your ad? Two, what does your ad focus on? When I ask business owners what the purpose of their ad is, I usually get a list like branding, getting my name out there, letting people know about my products and services, making sales, getting people to call in for a quote. These are all very different, and you cannot possibly do all of these with one ad. In typical small business style, they're trying to get maximum bang for their buck. But by trying to do too much, they end up achieving none of their objectives. My rule of thumb is one ad, one objective. If something in the ad isn't helping you achieve that objective, then it's detracting from it and you should get rid of it. That includes sacred cows like your company name and company logo. Advertising space is valuable, and these things taking up prime real estate in your ad space often detract from your message rather than enhance it. Rather than trying to sell directly from your ad, simply invite prospects to put their hand up and indicate interest. This lowers resistance and helps you build a marketing database, one of the most valuable assets in your business. Once your objective is clear, you need to communicate it to your reader. What exactly do you want them to do next? Do they call your toll-free number to order? Do they call you or visit your website to request a free sample? Do they request a free report? You need a very clear call to action, not something wimpy and vague like, don't hesitate to call us. You need to be clear on what they should do next and what they will get in return. Also, give them multiple ways to take that action. For example, if the call to action is to order your product, Give them the ability to do it online, over the phone, or even via a mail-in coupon. Different people have different preferences when it comes to modality of communication. Give them multiple means of response so they can choose the one they are most comfortable with. Have you ever been to a party or gathering and been seated next to someone who just spends the whole night talking about themselves? It gets old pretty fast. You keep giving half-hearted smiles and polite nods, but your mind is elsewhere, and that exit sign is calling your name. Similarly, most advertising by small businesses is inwardly focused. Instead of speaking to the needs and problems of the prospect, it is focused on self-aggrandizement. The prominent logo and company name, 
the laundry list of services, the claims of being the leading provider of that product or service. All of these things are shouting, Look at me! Unfortunately, you're in a crowded market, and with everyone shouting, Look at me! at the same time, it just becomes background noise. By contrast, direct response marketing focuses heavily on the needs, thoughts, and emotions of the target market. By doing this, you enter the conversation already going on in the mind of your ideal prospect. You will resonate at a deeper level with your prospect, and your ad will stand out from 99% of other ads that are just shouting and talking about themselves. Don't be the advertising equivalent of that guy at a party obliviously talking about himself the whole night while his uninterested audience looks for the exit. Also, don't leave anything to chance. Know exactly what you want your ad to achieve and the exact action you want your prospect to take. Developing a Unique Selling Proposition Many small businesses don't have a reason to exist. Take away their name and logo from their website or other marketing material, and you'd never know who they were. They could be any of the other businesses in their category. Their reason for existence is to survive and pay the bills of the owner, who is usually only just getting by, or possibly not even. From a customer's perspective, there is no compelling reason to buy from them, and any sales they do make is just because they happen to be there. You see a lot of these businesses in retail. The only sales they get is through random walk-in traffic. No one is seeking them out. No one actively desires what they have to offer, and if they weren't there, no one would miss them. Harsh, but true. The problem is that these businesses are just another me-too business. How did they decide on price? How did they decide on product? How did they decide on marketing? Usually the answer is they just had a look at what their nearest competitor was doing and did the same thing or slightly changed something. Don't get me wrong, there's nothing wrong in modeling something that's already working. In fact, that's a very smart thing to do. However, it's likely the competitors they are modeling are in the same boat they are in struggling to win business with no compelling reason why you should buy from them. They base their most important business decisions on guesses and on what their mediocre competitors are doing. It's the blind leading the blind. After some time of torturing themselves to death, making just enough money to survive but not enough money to do well, many of these businesses finally decide to try marketing. So they start marketing their Me Too business with an equally boring Me Too message. As expected, it doesn't work, and any extra sales it does bring in often doesn't even cover the marketing costs. Here's the thing. The chance of you getting your marketing perfectly right, message to market, and media match on the first go is impossibly small. Even the most experienced marketer will tell you they hardly ever hit a home run on their first go. It takes several iterations. It takes testing and measuring to finally get your message to market, and media match right. Yet, these guys can't afford the time, money, and effort needed to get it right. Worse still, with a Me Too style of offer, they don't have a hope. Think of marketing as an amplifier. Here's an example. You tell one person about what you do, and they don't get excited. You then try telling 10 people about what you do, and they don't get excited either. If you amplify this message through marketing and tell 10,000 people, what makes you think that the result will be any different? Marketing is an uphill battle if you haven't clearly clarified first in your mind why your business exists and why people should buy from you rather than your nearest competitor. You need to develop your Unique Selling Proposition, USP. This is where a lot of people get stuck. They say something like, I sell coffee. There's nothing unique about that. Really? then why aren't we all just getting our $1 coffee from 7-Eleven? Why do we queue up to spend $4 to $5 to buy our coffee from some hipster that looks like he's in urgent need of a bath? Think about it. You regularly pay 400% to 500% more for the same commodity. Think about water, one of the most abundant commodities on earth. When you buy this commodity in bottled form at either a convenience store or from a vending machine, you happily pay 2,000 times the price compared to getting it from your tap at home. 
See how the commodity in both examples hasn't changed, but the circumstances and things around the commodity have changed, or the way they are packaged and delivered has changed? The entire goal of your USP is to answer this question. Why should I buy from you rather than from your nearest competitor? Another good test is this. If I remove the company name and logo from your website, would people still know that it's you, or could it be any other company in your industry? The common place that people go wrong with developing their USP is they say, quality or great service is their USP. There are two things wrong with that. One, quality and great service are expectations. They're just part of good business practice, not something unique. Two, people only find out about your quality and great service after they've bought. A good USP is designed to attract prospects before they've made a purchasing decision. You know you're marketing your business as a commodity when prospects start the conversation by asking you about price. Positioning yourself as a commodity and hence being shopped on price alone is a terrible position for a small business owner to be in. It's soul-crushing, and this race to the bottom is bound to end in tears. The answer is to develop a unique selling proposition, USP, something that positions you differently so that prospects are forced to make an apples-to-oranges comparison when comparing you with your competitor. If they can do an apples-to-apples -apples comparison of you and your competitors, then it comes down to price and your toast. There's always someone willing to sell cheaper than you. There's nothing new under the sun. Very few, if any, businesses or products are truly unique, so a common question is, there's nothing unique about my business. How do I develop a USP? There are two questions I ask my clients when helping them develop their USP. Answering these two questions is the path toward marketing and financial success in your business. So, the two questions you must ask and answer are, Why should they buy? Why should they buy from me? These are questions that should have clear, concise, and quantifiable answers not wishy-washy nonsense like, we are the best, or we have the highest quality. What is the unique advantage you are offering? Now, the uniqueness doesn't have to be in the product itself. In fact, it would be fair to say that there are very few truly unique products. The uniqueness may be in the way it is packaged, delivered, supported, or even sold. You need to position what you do in such a way that even if your competitor was operating directly opposite you, customers would cross the road to do business with you instead of your competitor. Do it really well, and they may even stand in line overnight to do business with you instead of your competitor, like they do with Apple products. Getting into the mind of your prospect We want to get into the mind of our prospect. What do they really want? It's rarely the thing you are selling. It's usually the result of the thing you are selling. The difference may seem subtle, but it's huge. For example, someone buying a $50 watch is buying something very different from a person buying a $50,000 watch. In the latter case, they are likely buying status, luxury, and exclusivity. Sure, they want it to tell time, just like the buyer of the $50 watch, but that's unlikely to be their core motivation. So to get into the mind of the prospect, we need to discover what result they are actually buying. Once you understand this, you then need to craft your unique selling proposition based on the results your prospects want to achieve. For example, if you're a printer, you're in a commodity business. You want to get out of the commodity business as quickly as possible. I don't mean get out of the industry, but you do need to change how you position yourself. Stop selling business cards, brochures, and printing and start asking open-ended questions such as, Why are you coming to a printer? What is it that you want to achieve? The prospect doesn't want business cards and brochures. They want what they think business cards and brochures are going to do for their business. So you could sit down with them and say, What are you trying to accomplish? Let's do a printing audit and evaluate all of the things you're trying to use printing for. By taking them through the process, you can charge them to do a printing audit. Then, if they end up hiring you to do their printing, you can apply that consulting fee towards printing. 
This way you're no longer viewed as a printer anymore. You're now viewed as a trusted advisor that's serving their needs. If you confuse them, you lose them. Understand that your prospect has essentially three options. Buy from you. Buy from your competitor. Do nothing. You may think your competitors are your biggest problem, but in reality it's more likely to be a fight against inertia. Therefore, you need to first answer the question of why they should buy. Then you need to answer the question of why they should buy from you. We live in a soundbite MTV generation, which has to deal with thousands of messages each day. The importance of crafting your message in an immediately understandable and impactful way has never been more important. Can you explain your product and the unique benefit it offers in a single short sentence? You must understand a very important concept. Confusion leads to lost sales. This is especially so when you have a complex product. Many business owners erroneously think that a confused customer will seek clarification or contact you for more information. Nothing could be further from the truth. When you confuse them, you lose them. People have too many options and too much information coming at them constantly, and they're rarely motivated enough to wade through a confused message. How to be remarkable when you are selling a commodity. How do you charge high prices for your products and services while having your customers thank you for it? In short, by being remarkable. When given this answer, the first thing many business owners do is mutter under their breath something like, easier said than done. Perhaps it's because being remarkable evokes visions of being unattainably unique or creative, something that others far more talented do. The cafe owner says, Dude, I just sell coffee. How am I supposed to be remarkable? That raises a common question. How can you be remarkable when you sell a commodity? Let's look at a few examples. When I talk about being remarkable, it doesn't necessarily mean that the product or service you sell is unique. Far from it. In fact, being unique is a dangerous, difficult, and expensive place to be. However, you must be different. How can our cafe owner be different? One example is with coffee art. A copy of this visual element can be accessed at marketingaudiobook.com. How much extra did it cost the cafe to serve art with its coffee? Pretty close to zero, I would expect. Maybe some extra training for the barista and a few extra seconds of time per cup. But how many people will each customer tell or better still bring in to show? Could this cafe owner charge 50 cents more per cup than the cafe down the road? For sure. That's 50 cents of pure profit multiplied by hundreds of thousands of cups per year straight to the bottom line. Yet, is the product unique? Not by a long shot. Just slightly different. Different enough to be remarkable. Here's another example. Most e-commerce sites send the same boring confirmation email when you buy from them. Something along the lines of, Your order has been shipped. Please let us know if it doesn't arrive. Thank you for your business. Instead, have a look at how CD Baby creates a remarkable experience for the customer and a viral marketing opportunity for themselves instead of a normal, boring confirmation email. Your CD has been gently taken from our CD Baby shelves with sterilized, contamination-free gloves and placed onto a satin pillow. A team of 50 employees inspected your CD and polished it to make sure it was in the best possible condition before mailing. Our packing specialist from Japan lit a candle and a hush fell over the crowd as he put your CD into the finest, gold-lined box that money can buy. We all had a wonderful celebration afterwards, and the whole party marched down the street to the post office where the entire town of Portland waved, Bon voyage to your package on its way to you in our private CD baby jet on this day, Friday, June 6th. I hope you had a wonderful time shopping at CD Baby. We sure did. Your picture is on our wall as Customer of the Year. We're all exhausted, but can't wait for you to come back to CDBaby.com. This order confirmation email has been forwarded thousands of times and posted on countless blogs and websites. Derek Sivers, the founder of CD Baby, credits this remarkable order confirmation message for creating thousands of new customers. Again, nothing unique about the product, 
but the transformation of something ordinary and boring gives the customer a smile and creates free viral marketing for the business. One more example from another highly competitive commodity industry, consumer electronics. When Apple first launched their legendary music player, the iPod, they could have talked about the 5 gigabyte storage capacity or other technical features, like all the other music players of the day did. But instead, how did they promote it? 1,000 songs in your pocket. Genius. 5 gigabytes doesn't mean a thing to most consumers. Neither does a bunch of technical jargon, but 1,000 songs in your pocket? Anyone can instantly understand that and the benefits it will offer. Apple was by no means the first portable music player on the market or even the best, but they were by far the most successful because of their ability to quickly and easily convey the reasons why you should buy. Notice in all three of the examples, the actual product being sold is a commodity, and what makes it remarkable is something totally peripheral to what you are buying. Yet, the seller can, and does, command premium pricing because they are selling a remarkable experience. Not only is the customer happy to pay the premium, but in fact rewards the seller by spreading the message about their product or service. Why? Because we all want to share things and experiences that are remarkable. What can you do in your business that's remarkable? Your clarity around this will have a huge impact on the success of your business. Lowest Price I'm sometimes asked, Can't lowest price be my USP? Sure it can. But can you absolutely guarantee that everything you sell will be priced lower than all your competitors, including the behemoths like Costco and Walmart? Unlikely. There'll always be someone willing to go out of business faster than you. I suggest you not play that game. So, a USP that says, Lowest prices on some things, some of the time, is not quite so compelling. The fact is, if you're a small or medium business, you're unlikely to beat the big discounters at the lowest price game. Truth be told, you probably don't want to. By charging higher prices, you attract a better quality client. As counterintuitive as it may seem, you get far less grief from high-end customers than you do from low-end ones. I've seen and experienced this in multiple businesses across multiple industries. A better option than discounting is to increase the value of your offering. Bundling in bonuses, adding services, customizing the solution can all be of genuine value to your customer, but can cost you very little to do. This also helps you create that valuable apples-to-oranges comparison that gets you out of the commodity game. Don't hate the player, hate the game. So, as hard as it may be to resist, don't play the commodity-slash-price game. Develop your USP, deliver on it, and make those you deal with play your game on your terms. Create Your Elevator Pitch As a business owner, being able to succinctly convey what problem you solve is a real art, especially if you're in a business that is complex. A great way of distilling your USP is by crafting an elevator pitch. An elevator pitch is a concise, well-rehearsed summary of your business and its value proposition, which can be delivered in the time span of an elevator ride, that is, 30 to 90 seconds. Yes, it's cheesy, and you may not even really use it often as an elevator pitch, but it can really help you clarify your message and your USP. This will become extremely valuable when you get to crafting your offer, which we'll cover shortly. The 30 seconds that follows the what do you do question is one of the most commonly wasted marketing opportunities. The response is almost always self-focused, unclear, and often nonsensical. This is where many people reply with the highest sounding title they can get away with as they feel the inquirer's judgment of their worth will depend on the answer. I'm a waste management technician, says the janitor. I once asked a lady what she did for a living, to which she replied, I'm a senior event builder. None the wiser about what she did, I continued probing, until I finally came to understand that she arranges seating for concerts and large events in stadiums. While it's true some shallow people judge a person's worth by their job title or line of business, there's a much better way to respond to this question. 
a way that doesn't require you to raid a thesaurus in order to inflate or obfuscate what you really do. The next time someone asks you what you do for a living, it's your cue to deliver an elevator pitch. It's a perfect opportunity to convey your marketing message on a regular basis and in many different settings. Obviously, you don't want to come across as a pushy, obnoxious salesperson, so it's important to structure your elevator pitch properly. Most elevator pitches suffer from the same problem as overinflated job titles. It leaves the recipient confused or thinking, what a douchebag, rather than the intended effect of impressing them. Bad marketing is highly product-focused and self-focused. Good marketing, especially direct response marketing, is always customer and problem-slash-solution focused, and that's exactly how we want our elevator pitch to be. We want to be remembered for what problem we solve, rather than for some impressive but incomprehensible title or line of business. Good marketing takes the prospect through a journey that covers the problem, the solution, and finally the proof. Your elevator pitch should be no different. So, how do you effectively communicate these three components in the space of 30 or so seconds? The best formula I've seen is, you know, problem? Well, what we do is solution, in fact, proof. Here are a few examples. Insurance sales. You know how most people rarely review their insurance coverage when their circumstances change? Well, what I do is help people have peace of mind by making sure their insurance coverage always matches their current circumstances. In fact, just last week a client of mine was robbed, but he was able to recover the full cost of the items he lost because his insurance coverage was up to date. Electrical Engineering You know when there are power outages that bring down critical systems in large businesses? Well, what I do is install backup power systems for companies that rely on having a continual supply of power for their operations. In fact, I installed the system at XYZ Bank, which has resulted in them having 100% uptime since the system was installed. Website Development You know how most company websites are out of date? Well, what I do is install software that makes it easy for people to update their own websites without the need to pay a web designer each time. In fact, I installed the software for one of my clients recently, and they save $2,000 a year in web development costs. This gives you a reliable formula to craft your elevator pitch while being customer-slash-problem-focused rather than you-slash-product-focused. Crafting your offer This part is absolutely crucial, and this is where a lot of people get lazy by offering something boring price discounting, or copying what their nearest competitor is doing. Remember, if you don't give your ideal target market a reason why your offer is different, they will default to price as the main criteria for making their decision. After all, if vendor A is selling apples for a dollar, and vendor B is selling seemingly the same apples for a dollar fifty, which would you buy based on the information you have at hand? It's your job to create an offer that is exciting and radically different from that of your competitors. Two great questions to think about when you're crafting your offer are, one, of all the products and services you offer, which do you have the most confidence in delivering? For example, if you only got paid if the client achieved their desired result, what product or service would you offer? Phrasing it another way, what problem are you sure that you could solve for a member of your target market? Two. Of all the products and services you offer, which do you enjoy delivering the most? Some supplemental questions that can help you craft your offer include, what is my target market really buying? For example, people don't really buy insurance, they buy peace of mind. What's the biggest benefit to lead with? What are the best emotionally charged words and phrases that will capture and hold the attention of this market? What objections do my prospects have and how will I solve them? What outrageous offer, including a guarantee, can we make? Is there an intriguing story we can tell? Who else is selling something similar to my product or service, and how? Who else has tried selling them something similar, and how has that effort failed? One of the main reasons marketing campaigns fail is because the offer is lazy and poorly thought out. It's something crappy and unexciting, like 10% or 20% off. The offer is one of the most important parts of your marketing campaign, 
and you need to spend much of your time and energy on structuring this correctly. What does my target market want? Putting the right stuff in front of the wrong people or the wrong stuff in front of the right people is one of the first marketing mistakes made by business owners. That's why the first and arguably most important square of the one-page marketing plan is all about identifying a specific target market for our marketing efforts. Now that we've laid that groundwork, we want to structure an offer that will excite this target market, one that will have them ready to whip out their wallet and one that will stand out from all the boring, lazy offers from our competitors. One of the easiest methods of finding out what your prospects want is simply by asking them. You can do so through a survey or through more formal market research. It should also be noted that most people don't know what they want until they've actually been presented with it. Also, when people are doing surveys or responding to market research, they do so with logic. However, when it comes to actual purchasing, this is done with emotions and justified with logic after the fact. So you need to supplement asking with observing. If you asked those in the market for expensive luxury cars as to what they wanted, you typically get logical and untrue or half-true answers like quality, reliability, comfort. In reality, what they really want is status. A quote often attributed to Henry Ford puts it well, If I had asked people what they wanted, they would have said faster horses. One of the ways I recommend doing market research is by analyzing what your target market are actually buying or looking for. Look at products and categories that are trending on marketplaces like Amazon and eBay. Analyzing search engine queries using a tool like Google's AdWords keyword tool can be another excellent method. Lastly, see what topics are trending on social media and industry news sites. What are people commenting on and reacting to? Using these tools is almost like tapping into the global consciousness and will give you a good idea of what is currently in demand and being talked or thought about. Create an irresistible offer. Now that you know what your market wants, you need to package it up and present it as an irresistible offer. Here are some of the essential elements. Value. First, you need to think, what is the most valuable thing you could do for your customer? What is the result which takes them from point A to point B that you can take them through while making a good profit? This really is the crux of your offer. Language. If you're not a member of your target market, you need to learn the language and jargon used within your target market. If you're selling BMX bikes, you need to talk about endos, sick wheelies, and bunny hops, not features, benefits, and specifications. If you're selling golf clubs, you need to talk about hooks, slices, and handicaps. Reason why. When you have a great offer, you need to justify why you're doing this. People are so used to being shortchanged that when someone makes a strong, value-filled offer, they become skeptical and look for the catch. I've personally experienced this in one of my businesses where we were offering a much better service at a price that was about half the price of our competitors. People kept ringing into the sales line to recap the offer that was on the website and to ask what the catch was. I don't suggest you fabricate reasons for your offer, but be ready to have a solid reason why you are offering a great deal. For example, clearing old stock, damaged inventory, overstock, moving your office or warehouse, etc. Value Stacking Packing in many bonuses can make your offer seem like a no-brainer. This is a very smart move and can dramatically increase conversions. In fact, I advocate where possible to make the bonuses more valuable than the main offer. Infomercials do this very well. We'll double your offer, that's not all, etc. Upsells. When your prospect is hot and in the buying frame of mind, this is the perfect time to offer them a complimentary product or service. This is where you have the perfect opportunity to tack on a high-margin item even if the primary product you are selling is low margin. It's the fries with a burger, the extended warranty, the car rust-proofing. It gives the customer added value and gives you more profit per transaction. Payment Plan This one is absolutely critical for high-ticket items and can mean the difference between the customer balking and walking away or making the sale. If something is $5,000, 
presenting it as 12 easy payments of $497, makes it a much easier pill to swallow. People generally think of their expenses on a monthly basis, and $497 per month feels much easier than $5,000 in one lump sum. Also notice that 12 times 497 adds up to more than $5,000. In fact, it makes it almost $6,000. The first reason you want to do this is to cover your finance costs if you're financing the sale. Second, you want to incentivize the people who can pay in a lump sum to receive a discount by paying up front. Guarantee As discussed previously in this chapter, you need an outrageous guarantee, one that totally reverses the risk of doing business with you. People have been disappointed so many times that they don't trust any of the claims you make. It's nothing personal, that's just the way it is. You need to make dealing with you a risk-free transaction. In fact, one where the risk is on you should you fail to deliver on your promises. Satisfaction guaranteed is weak and ineffective. Scarcity Your offer needs to have an element of scarcity, a reason why people need to respond immediately. People respond much more to a fear of loss than the prospect of gain. However, again, you need a good reason why the scarcity exists, as you don't want to be disingenuous with your scarcity claims. You have a limited supply, limited time, limited resources. Use this to your advantage in your marketing. If you can have a running countdown of time or available stock, this can further turn up the heat on the fear of loss emotion. As you've seen, there are many components to crafting a compelling offer. Taking the lazy, ill-thought-out road of 10% off or similar crappy offers is akin to throwing your marketing dollars in the trash. Take the time to craft a compelling, well-thought-out offer. Your conversion rate will skyrocket, and so will your bottom line. Target the pain. You've got a splitting headache. You open your medicine cabinet and start rifling through your museum of half-used tablets, creams, and vitamins, only to realize you're totally out of pain relief medication. So you rush down to your local pharmacy in the hope of getting the tablet that's going to give you the relief you so desperately need. Do you worry about the price? Does it even enter your mind to shop around and see if you can buy the same product cheaper at another pharmacy? Unlikely. You're in pain and you need immediate relief. In fact, even if the tablets were priced at double or triple the normal price, you'd probably still buy. The usual ways of shopping get thrown out the window when we're in pain. The exact same is true for your customers and prospects. So many times, businesses talk about features and benefits rather than speaking to the pain that the customer already has. How much selling does a pharmacist need to do to sell pain relief medication to someone with a splitting headache? Very little, I suspect. The same is true whether you sell TVs, cars, or consulting. You have prospects and customers who are in pain. They want pain relief, not features and benefits. If you're selling me a TV, you could sell me features and benefits by telling me it's got four HDMI ports and 1080p resolution. This will mean very little to most people. Imagine instead you target my pain point, which is bringing it back home, unpacking it, and spending an infuriating number of hours trying to get it working properly with all my other devices. Instead of price discounting and positioning yourself as a commodity, why not offer to deliver it to my house, mount it on the wall, ensure the picture quality is spectacular, and make sure that it works perfectly with all my other peripherals? Now you're giving me pain relief, and price becomes less important than if you're selling me a commodity with a list of features and benefits. In the above example, even though you might be selling the exact same TV as your competitor, if you package it up in a way that takes away my pain, then you've won my business. It's also much more likely I'll become a raving fan and refer others to you because you weren't just the vendor of a commodity. You were a problem solver. Now it's an apples to oranges comparison. How do you compare this to, it's got four HDMI ports and 1080p resolution? Selling features and benefits is the best way to turn your prospects into price shoppers who view your product as a commodity bought solely on price. Your goal is to be a problem solver, pain reliever, and turn any comparison with your competition into an apples-to-oranges comparison. 
Remember, people are much more willing to pay for a cure than for prevention. Targeting existing pain, rather than promising future pleasure, will result in much higher conversion, much higher customer satisfaction, and lower price resistance. Look for pain points in your industry and become the source of relief. Copywriting for sales. You can't bore people into buying. Almost no other skill will reward you as richly as being able to write compelling words. Being able to clearly articulate why a prospect should buy from you rather than your competitors in a way that creates an emotion and motivates them to action is the master skill of marketing. Earlier in this book, we touched on the fact that direct response marketing uses very different copywriting techniques. In direct response marketing, we use copy which is designed to push the emotional hot buttons of the target audience. Rather than using the conventional, boring, professional-sounding copy, we use copy that is like a car accident. No matter how much you don't want to, you can't help but look. Emotional direct response copywriting uses attention-grabbing headlines, strong sales copy, and compelling calls to action. It's what's known as salesmanship in print. Many businesses especially those who sell products and services to professional or business customers, feel like this type of copy is not appropriate for their market. And while it's true we should tailor our approach to this market, as we would for any target market, it would be a major mistake to discount emotional direct response copywriting. From the CEO of a Fortune 500 company down to the janitor, we're all big bags of emotion, and our buying decisions are made with emotion and then justified with logic later. Hey, honey, I bought that Porsche 911 because of safety, and German cars are really reliable, too. Yeah, right. So many times when I meet business owners in person, I find their personality is completely different from the personality displayed in their marketing. Truth be told, most display no personality in their marketing at all. The reason behind this is a perceived need to look professional. Their marketing is often bland, generic, and if you swapped out their logo and name from their marketing material, it could be anyone else in their industry. It's such a shame, because if only they communicated in their marketing the way they do in person, they'd have much more success. When you meet them in person, these people are often highly intelligent, interesting to listen to, and passionate about what they do. Yet when it comes to their marketing material and sales copy, it's like they freeze up. All of a sudden, they try to sound professional and start using weasel words and phrases they would never normally use in conversation. You know the sort of words and phrases I mean. Best of breed products, synergistic, strategic alignment, etc. Words they'd never use in a real conversation with their friends or colleagues. The fact is, people buy from people, not from corporations. Building relationships and rapport is well understood in the world of one-to-one -one sales. However, for some reason, when it comes to the one-to-many position of being a marketer, many business owners think they need to put their personality aside and behave like a faceless corporation. Copywriting is salesmanship in print. You need to write your sales copy as though you were talking directly to a single person. Using monotone, boring, professional sales copy is the fastest way of losing the interest of your customers and prospects. Meaningless cliches and claims of being the leading provider in your category makes you look like a Me Too business. Me Too businesses attract lowest common denominator clients who by necessity shop based on price as they have nothing else to differentiate you by. People love authenticity, personality, and opinion. Even if they don't agree with you, They'll respect you for being real and open. Being yourself and bringing out your personality will help you stand out in a sea of sameness and monotony. Just have a look at one of the most consistently enduring TV formats, the news talking head. Why waste such a large percentage of airtime on showing the face of the presenter? Using just their voiceover would mean that a lot more content and visual footage of the news story could be broadcast. However, the reason so much time is allocated to just the video of a talking head is that it adds personality to often bland topics. It also adds authority and feels like a one-on-one -on -one conversation with a trusted source. People respond to pictures and videos of other people. 
It's no accident that YouTube and Facebook are two of the biggest online properties in the world. We're extremely interested in what other people are doing and saying. You can easily take advantage of this in your business. One example is by adding a video to your website. It can be as simple as a talking head video of you describing your products and services, which you can shoot and upload in the space of five minutes using a handheld camera or even a smartphone. Another example is using social media as a two-way communication medium for engaging with customers and prospects. Doing just these two things will create deeper connections because you're adding personality to your business. Don't use your marketing material as a screen to hide behind. Use it to give opinion, insight, advice, and commentary, and above all, be yourself and be authentic. This will instantly create rapport and will differentiate you from all the other boring and bland marketing material around you. People open their mail above a waste paper basket and have their index finger hovering over the delete button when reading email. They sort it into two piles. The first pile gets opened and read, and the second pile goes into the trash, often unopened. People are craving something new, something entertaining, something different. When you give that to them, you get their attention. When your copy is professional, it's boring, monotone, and ignored. The fact is that most businesses are too afraid to send out copy that will get them noticed. They fear what their friends, relatives, industry peers, and others will think or say. So they send out letters and ads which are timid and me too. Swap the company name and logo and they are pretty much interchangeable with every one of their other competitors. There's really only one opinion you should be worrying about, that of your customers and prospects. Frankly, no one else's opinion, including yours, should figure in what you put in your sales copy. Testing and measuring response is the only true way of judging the effectiveness of your copy. The truth is, the masses are living lives of quiet desperation. They are absolutely craving something that grabs or entertains them, even if it's just for a moment. Your job is to give it to them. Elements of Great Copy It's incredible how a change in a word or phrase can dramatically change the effectiveness of an ad. The fact is there are some words which are extremely powerful and trigger emotional hot buttons. For example, think about the following three words. Animal, fish, shark. Which of these three triggers the most emotional response in you? I suspect it's the last one, yet they could all be used to describe the same creature. The same is true of words you use when writing sales copy. Some words trigger a bigger emotional response than others. Here are just a small sample of the most common compelling words. Free, you, save, results, health, love, proven, money, new, easy, safety, guaranteed, discovery. A one-word change in your headline can dramatically alter the results you achieve. Always remember, people buy with emotions first and then justify with logic afterwards. Trying to sell to their logical brain with facts and figures is a complete waste of time. The five major motivators of human behavior, especially buying behavior, are fear, love, greed, guilt, pride. If your sales copy isn't pushing at least one of these emotional hot buttons, then it's likely too timid and ineffective. Headlines are one of the most important elements in your sales copy. Their job is to grab the attention of your target market and get them to start reading your body copy. The headline is basically the ad for the ad and should encompass the self-serving result your reader will get. You'll use headlines extensively in your marketing when writing email subject lines, sales letter headlines, or web page titles. Here's a small sample of headlines from some of the most successful advertising campaigns throughout history. They laughed when I sat down at the piano. But when I started to play, who else wants a screen star figure? Amazing secret discovered by one-legged golfer adds 50 yards to your drives, eliminates hooks and slices, and can slash up to 10 strokes from your game almost overnight. Confessions of a disbarred lawyer. Have you ever seen a grown man cry? An open letter to every overweight person in Portland. Is the life of a child worth a dollar to you? How a strange accident saved me from baldness. When the government freezes your bank account, what then? 
How a Fool Stunt Made a Star Salesman Wife of famous movie star swears under oath her new perfume does not contain an illegal sexual stimulant. Profits that lie hidden in your farm. Proof. Doctors are more dangerous than guns. Notice how all the successful, tested headlines above push one or more of the five major motivators of human behavior? To get a list of hundreds of the most successful headlines in advertising history, visit marketingaudiobook.com. Fear, especially the fear of loss, is one of the most powerful emotional hot buttons you can push in your sales copy. Understanding how certain words link to certain emotions is powerful. Many worry that this is too manipulative. Like any powerful tool, it can be used for good or for evil purposes, and no doubt many people do both. A sharp knife in the hands of a surgeon can be used to save a life or in the hands of a criminal to take a life. Either way, we need to understand how this powerful tool works, and likely we can't go through life avoiding its use. The same thing is applied to emotional direct response copywriting. It's a powerful selling tool, and you should never use it unethically. If you sell something that is in the best interest of your prospect or customer, then you are actually doing them a great service by using this powerful selling tool. You are preventing them from buying someone else's inferior product or service. Enter the conversation already going on in your prospect's mind. We all have a conversation going on in our mind all the time. Sometimes this is referred to as inner talk. That conversation is going to be very different if you are an expectant mother compared to a retiree, or a fanatical fitness junkie compared to a couch potato. This is part of why it's so important to understand your target market well. An emotional hot button for one type of target audience will fall on deaf ears to another audience. Emotional direct response copywriting is no substitute for understanding exactly who your target audience is and what their emotional triggers are. Before you ever write a single word of copy, you must intimately understand how your target market thinks and talks, the kind of language they use and respond to, what kind of day they have, and the conversation that goes on in their mind. What are their fears and frustrations? What gets them excited and motivated? Research is often the most neglected component of copywriting and is the major reason why even powerful copy can sometimes fail. Emotional direct response copywriting is a powerful tool in your marketing arsenal, but understand it is part of a process. Research, write, then test and measure, and you'll be far ahead of 99.9% of all your competitors. Another way to enter the conversation going on in your prospect's mind is to address the elephant in the room. It's natural to always try and present your business in the most favorable light possible when marketing yourself. However, this often leads to one of the most common marketing blunders, discussing only the positive aspects of doing business with you. Avoiding the elephant in the room, that is, the risks associated with buying from you, is a rookie mistake. The amygdala is the fear part of our brain. It governs our reactions to events that are important for our survival, and it stimulates fear to warn us of imminent danger. If you're being followed at night by a suspicious-looking individual and your heart is pounding, that's your amygdala doing its job. That's good. However, the amygdala in your prospect's brain can also stop them from buying from you. That's bad. Whether you own a coffee shop or a hospital, when a prospective customer considers buying from you, their amygdala is making a judgment call about the potential risks involved. The risk being evaluated by the amygdala may be as trivial as a bad-tasting latte or as severe as an untimely death on an operating table. Either way, the risk evaluation is always going on in the background. As a business owner and marketer, you need to understand that. If you skirt around this issue in your marketing, you allow the amygdala in your prospect's brain to run wild and potentially kill the sale. Given that this risk evaluation will happen whether you like it or not, why not participate in it and give yourself the best chance of addressing any potential deal-breakers before they get a chance to damage your bottom line? Traditional selling tells us to overcome objections. However, in reality, objections are rarely voiced. Instead, in our polite society, we say nonsense things like, let me think about it. Well, inside, the amygdala is screaming, let's get out of here. 
Part of the job of good sales copy is to tell potential prospects who your product or service is not for. There are three very good reasons you should do this. First, it filters out people who aren't part of your target market or those who wouldn't be a good fit for what you have to offer. This ensures you don't waste your time on low-quality, low-probability prospects. It also reduces the number of refunds and complaints from customers who misunderstood what they bought. Second, it immediately makes it more credible when you tell them who this product is for. It feels much more even-handed when you cover both angles by telling them who it is for and who it isn't for. Last, the prospects who it is for will feel the product or service is much more tailored to their needs versus if you had said your product is for anyone and everyone. It feels more targeted and exclusive. Another excellent way to enter the mind of your prospect is to find out what they blame and use a device in your own copy known as the enemy in common. If you ask most people why they haven't achieved success, some of the most common responses include the economy, the government, taxes are too high, poor upbringing or parenting, unsupportive family or friends, no time, no money, no opportunity, lack of skills or education, unfair boss. There's just one thing wrong with this list. They aren't on it. Here are the results of a national survey which was conducted by one of the major newspapers on cost of living pressure, also known as spending too much and earning too little. You can see how few people blame themselves for their current circumstances. The survey asks the question, who do you blame for cost of living pressure? 55% respond with government policy. 14.3% respond with the shaky global economy. 14.2% respond with big business. The remainder respond with the Reserve Bank, small business, I don't know, or my own bad habits or decisions. A copy of this visual element can be accessed at marketingaudiobook.com. According to the Journal of Safety Research, 74% of Americans believe they are above average drivers, yet only 1% believe they are below average. It's the same with accepting blame. How many times have you heard a child say, It's not my fault? As adults, people are much the same. Most of us don't believe we are in the wrong. So what can you do with this knowledge? First, in your sales copy, never blame your prospects for the position they are in. If we're going to enter the conversation already going on in their mind, our marketing message needs to take into account these existing thought processes, no matter how foreign they are from our own. The enemy in common is a great way of leveraging the it's not my fault mentality. Take something relevant from your prospect's blame list, side with them, and tie it into a solution you have to offer. Here's a sample headline that an accountant could use. Free report reveals how to reclaim your hard-earned cash from the greedy tax man. This is a great way of bonding with your prospect while offering them a solution. By using a common enemy, you connect with a prospect and you're seen as the savior against a foe, in this case, government taxes. The enemy in common rattles their cage, enters the conversation already going on in their mind, and stirs up the emotions that are already there just below the surface. It's a great way to break through the clutter and get your prospect's attention. How to Name Your Product, Service, or Business I've had the naming discussion with entrepreneurs many times. It usually goes like this. I'll be asked for my opinion on a new name or several variations thereof for a new product, service, or business venture. Then often follows an explanation of the name or names which are being considered. Here's my take on naming. If you need to explain the name, to me that's an automatic fail. Title should equal content. In other words, if the name doesn't make it automatically obvious what the product, service, or business is, then you're starting from behind. When I give people this advice, some shake their heads in disbelief. What about great brands with unusual names like Nike, Apple, Skype, Amazon, etc.? Surely I must be missing something by giving such simplistic advice? Here's the thing. All of the big brands spend hundreds of millions of dollars in advertising to educate people about who they are and what they do. How much are you willing to spend to do the same? Here, we're not even talking about advertising that sells or generates leads. We're talking about advertising that merely tells people what you do. I can't think of a bigger waste of money. 
By using a non-obvious name, you're starting from behind and then have to make up for it by spending a lot of money on advertising to rectify the situation. All you had to do to avoid this colossal waste of money was call your business Fast Plumbing Repairs, which immediately explains what you do and what you stand for, rather than Aqua Solutions, after which you have to explain that Aqua is the Latin for water and that you provide complete plumbing solutions, whatever that means, hence the name Aqua Solutions. So many times I've seen a business or product name whose meaning is unclear. Sometimes it's a corny play on words. Other times it's an obscure literary reference. And still other times it's some made-up word, the meaning of which is only apparent to the creator. The reality is no matter how clever your name is, very few people will go to the trouble of trying to decipher its meaning or origin. These things may be important to you because it's your baby, but rarely does a customer or prospect give it even a split second of thought. What's even worse is that being clever often creates confusion and works against you. As we covered earlier in this chapter, confusion leads to lost sales. If you confuse them, you lose them. It's that simple. Always choose clarity over cleverness. It's hard enough to get a message read, understood, then acted upon at the best of times. But intentionally adding confusion into the mix when you're a small business with a modest marketing budget is madness. Lastly, please don't ask friends and family for their opinion on your clever new name. They'll, of course, praise your idea and compliment you, which feels nice, but it's unlikely to be truly helpful. By all means, test and get opinions, but do so from objective people who are part of your target market, not from those who already know what you're about. Naming can work for you or against you, and it's expensive and difficult to change down the track, so give it thought, effort, and above all else, focus on clarity. Chapter 2 Action Item What is your message to your target market? Fill in square number 2 of your one-page marketing plan. Chapter 3. Reaching Prospects with Advertising Media Chapter 3 Summary Advertising media is the vehicle you'll use to reach your target market and communicate your message. It's typically the most expensive component of your marketing, so it needs to be selected and managed carefully to ensure you get a good return on investment, ROI. Highlights covered in this chapter include how to measure the effectiveness of a marketing campaign, why getting your name out there is a losing strategy, how to get a good return on investment, ROI, when advertising, the lifetime value of a customer and how this is split up between the front end and back end, the role that social media plays in your business, how to effectively use email and postal mail as part of your media strategy, how to protect your business from a single point of failure, The ROI Game John Wanamaker, one of the marketing greats, famously said, Half the money I spend on advertising is wasted. The trouble is I don't know which half. While this was understandable a century ago, when it was first said, it should be a crime to say that today. Yet the reality is that most small businesses do little, if any, tracking of advertising not measuring where your leads and sales come from and not tracking ROI on ad spend is the mark of an amateur. We all have at our disposal the technology to quickly, easily, and cheaply track advertising effectiveness. Tools such as toll-free numbers, website analytics, and coupon codes make this trivial. Remember, what gets measured gets managed. Be ruthless with your ad spend by cutting the losers and riding the winners. Obviously, to know what's losing and what's winning, you need to be tracking and measuring. This is vital because media is by far the most expensive component of your marketing spend. It's the bridge that connects your offer to your target market. Whether you're using traditional media like radio, TV, and print, or newer digital media like social, search engine optimization, SEO, and email marketing, you need to understand the idiosyncrasies of each. It's well beyond the scope of this book to go into the technical details of each category and subcategory of media. However, I'd give you this piece of general advice. 
hire experts that specialize in whatever media you decide is right for your campaign. They're worth their weight in gold. Don't try and do it yourself, especially when it comes to the most expensive part of your marketing process. What you don't know will hurt you. Whether you're using online media like social, email, or web, or offline media like direct mail, print, or radio, each has its own idiosyncrasies and technicalities that you're highly likely to mess up if you're not experienced with it. It would be a tragedy to get the target market and offer right and then have your campaign flop because you messed up a technical detail in your media. I'm often asked questions like, what's a good response rate for direct mail? Or, what kind of open rate should I expect when doing email marketing? The expectation is that I'll give a numerical answer, something like, expect a 2% response rate from direct mail, or expect a 20% open rate for email. Usually these kinds of questions come from well-meaning business owners who are yet to build their marketing infrastructure. My answer is always the same. It depends. Sometimes a 50% response rate is a disaster, and sometimes a 0.01% response rate is a massive success. Response rates will vary dramatically depending on factors such as how relevant the message is to the target market, how compelling the offer is, and how you came about the list you're marketing to. Instead of asking what a good response rate is, which is a nonsense question, they're really asking, how do I measure the success of my marketing campaign? So how do you measure the success of a marketing campaign? For the impatient, here's the short answer. Did the marketing campaign make you more money than it cost you? Another way of putting it is, what was the return on investment, ROI, on the marketing campaign? If it cost you more than you made or will ever make on this campaign, then it's a failure. If it cost you less than the profits you made as a result of the campaign, then it's a success. Of course, some people will argue with me and say that even a campaign that lost money was valuable because it got your name out there or was some sort of branding exercise. Unless you're a mega brand like Nike, Apple, Coca-Cola, or similar, then it's likely you can't afford to burn tens of millions of dollars on fuzzy marketing like branding or getting your name out there. Rather than getting your name out there, you'll fare much better by concentrating on getting the name of your prospects in here. I like to think of marketing dollars as firepower. You need to use your limited firepower wisely so that you can successfully hunt, come home victorious, and feed your family. However, if you start randomly firing in every direction, you're going to startle and scare off your prey. You need to be targeted and clever if you wish to be victorious. If you're a small or medium-sized business, you need to get a return on your marketing spend. Putting your comparatively tiny marketing budget into fuzzy marketing would have the same effect as a kid peeing in the ocean. The game of mass marketing slash branding slash getting your name out there type of marketing can only be won with atomic bomb scale firepower. If you're a small to medium business, that's not a game you're equipped to play. That being the case, we need to look at the numbers carefully. Let's run through an example with some numbers to illustrate. I'll keep the numbers small and round for the sake of clarity. You do a direct mail campaign and send out 100 letters. The cost of printing and mailing the 100 letters is $300. Out of 100 letters, 10 people respond, 10% response rate. Out of the 10 people who responded, 2 people end up buying from you, 20% closure rate. From this, we can work out one of the most important numbers in marketing, customer acquisition cost. In this example, you acquired 2 customers and the campaign cost you a total of $300. So your customer acquisition cost is $150. Now, if the product or service you sell these customers makes you a profit of only $100 per sale, then this was a losing campaign. You lost $50 for every customer acquired in this campaign, negative ROI. However, let's say the product or service you sell makes you a profit of $600 per sale, then this is a winning campaign. You made $450 for every customer acquired positive ROI. Now, obviously, this is a simplistic example, but it illustrates how irrelevant statistics like response rates and conversion rates are. Our primary concern is return on investment, which varies based on the customer acquisition cost 
and how much actual profit a marketing campaign yields. One of the massive advantages of targeting a niche is that your marketing becomes much cheaper. Targeted advertising ends up being cheaper than mass marketing because there is far less waste. If you're selling photography of newborn babies, you'd be far better served advertising in New Mother magazine than putting a general photography ad in the classifieds. Your customer acquisition cost will drop dramatically because your message to market match is much better and hence your conversion rate will be much higher than if you had a general message in your ad. Your advertising costs would also be lower because your target market is smaller. Remember, the entire goal of your ad is for your prospect to say, Hey, that's for me. Being all things to all people is unlikely to have the same reaction. The front end, back end, and lifetime value of a customer. With the example given, we determined that if we made only $100 of profit per sale, then we had a losing campaign. However, in that example, we didn't take into account one of the other very important numbers used in measuring marketing success, customer lifetime value. If, for example, we make $100 directly as a result of the campaign, but then the customer continues to buy from us down the track, that completely changes the economics of the campaign. A campaign that looked like a loser can in fact become a winner when we take into account the lifetime value of a customer. We now need to take into account how much we'll likely make on a customer over their entire tenure with us. For example, you might sell printers that require refills, or a car that requires servicing, or some other service that a customer buys repeatedly. For example, haircuts, massage, insurance, internet access, etc. The money we make up front on a campaign is known as the front end. The money we make on subsequent purchases is known as the back end. Together, these figures make up the lifetime value of a customer. Lifetime value and customer acquisition cost are two of the key numbers you need to know to measure marketing effectiveness. The other statistics like response rates and conversion rates in themselves are useless. We just use them to determine these two figures, which give us a true picture of how our marketing is performing. If you don't know what these numbers are in your business, then now's the time to start measuring and making your marketing accountable. Constantly testing, measuring, and improving these numbers is how you build a high-growth business. Your front-end offer is the offer that gets seen by prospects, people who aren't yet your customers. These are people who don't know you and have no reason to like you or trust you. In general, the goal of your front-end offer is to create a customer and make enough profit from the first transaction to at least cover the customer acquisition cost. This makes it very sustainable to keep advertising. The real profit is made on the back-end through repeat purchases by existing customers. Sometimes it makes sense to go negative, that is, lose money on the front-end, because you know for certain you'll make it up and more on the back-end. This is often the case with subscription businesses or businesses that have a high lifetime value. If you don't know your numbers, this can be a risky strategy, so stick to the goal of having your front end pay for your customer acquisition cost until you have a good handle on your lifetime value numbers. In Chapter 8, we'll talk more about the back end and increasing customer lifetime value. This can revolutionize your business and turn losing campaigns into winners. Is social media a cure-all? Without a doubt, the Internet and social media are media breakthroughs. They've democratized information and have made possible a level of connectedness never before possible. However, there's also a lot of hype that surrounds these forms of new media, as they're often referred to. Especially with all the hype that surrounds social media, you'd imagine it was a marketing cure-all. Many self-proclaimed social media gurus would have you believe that social media is the future of all marketing, and that if you're not dedicating all or most of your marketing resources to social media, you're a Luddite who will soon be out of business. Of course, as with most hype, there's a need to keep a level head in order to separate fact from fiction. Before I'm labeled as being against social media, let me set the record straight. I've used social media in multiple businesses and continue to use it on a regular basis. However, because there's so much hype that surrounds social media, I want to put it in perspective for you and help you see where it fits into an overall marketing strategy. 
A successful marketing campaign has to get three vital elements right. Market, covered in Chapter 1. The target market you send your message to. Message, covered in Chapter 2. The marketing message or offer you send. Media, covered in this chapter. The vehicle that you use to communicate your message to your target market. For example, radio, direct mail, telemarketing, internet, TV, etc. You need to hit all three of these to have a successful campaign. You need to send the right message to the right target market through the right media channel. Failing at any one of these three elements will likely cause your marketing campaign to fail. Understanding this framework helps put things in context. Social media, by definition, is a media. It's not a strategy. The time-tested fundamentals of marketing don't suddenly change just because a new type of media comes along. The next thing to ask, is it the right media for your business? Remember, of the three things we need to get right for a successful campaign, media is one of them. Every type of media has its idiosyncrasies, and social media is no exception. Here are some of the things you need to be aware of when it comes to social media. First, it's not the ideal selling environment. I like to think of social media as a social gathering or party. We've all been to gatherings where someone, perhaps a family member or friend, has been bitten by the multi-level marketing bug. You know, where they start spruiking the health benefits of the latest pills or potions and try to sell or recruit others to sell. It makes everyone uncomfortable because it feels pushy and feels like an inappropriate time to be making or receiving a sales pitch. Social media is exactly the same. Overt selling and constant pitching of offers is generally considered poor behavior on social networks and can result in repelling people from your business rather than attracting them. However, just like a real-life social gathering, social media is a great place to create and extend relationships which can later turn into something commercial if there's a good fit. One of the most valuable things I see in social media is being able to gauge customer emotions toward your business and engage with vocal customers who offer either praise or complaints in a public forum. A side benefit of this is social proof. Being accessible, responding to criticism or praise, and engaging with your customers builds social proof and makes prospects and customers feel like they are dealing with humans rather than a faceless corporation. Remember, people buy from people. There are two potential traps with social media. First, it can be a time suck. Feeling like you have to respond to every inane comment can be draining, and it can suck time away from marketing tasks that can give you a far better return on time and money invested. It's important to be disciplined with your use of social media. Just like you wouldn't let your employees stand around and chit-chat all day, you can't let yourself or them get carried away with the online equivalent. Some people have the perception that social media marketing is free. It's only truly free if your time is worth nothing. Second, there's the question of ownership. Your social media page and profile is actually the property of the social network so spending huge amounts of time and money building up a profile and audience on these networks ends up building up their assets rather than your own. My preference, as much as possible, is to build and own my own marketing assets, such as websites, blogs, email lists, etc. I then use social media simply as a way to drive traffic to these marketing assets. This way, my time and effort goes into renovating my own house rather than that of a landlord who can kick me out at any time. A classic example of why you want to do this is Facebook's change of policy on business pages. Previously, if people liked your business's Facebook page, you could freely reach this entire audience for free. So businesses spent a lot of time, money, and effort getting people to like them on their Facebook page. Now, Facebook requires you to pay them each time you want to send a message to your entire audience. Otherwise, it only allows you to reach a small percentage. For those who spent huge resources on building up a Facebook audience only to have the rug pulled out from under them, this came as a huge blow. This is one of the reasons why, personally, I prefer to have 1,000 people on my own email list than 10,000 people who like my Facebook page. As always with any marketing strategy, it's vitally important to find out where your prospects hang out and use the appropriate media to get your message through to them. Social media may or may not be one of those places they hang out.
Email Marketing Email is a direct, personal way to engage with prospects and customers. Thanks to the proliferation of smartphones and mobile devices, pretty much everyone has email in their pocket or within easy reach. Building a database of email subscribers plays a central role in your online marketing strategy. A prominent part of your website should be an email opt-in form. This enables you to capture the email address of website visitors and gives you the opportunity to nurture those visitors who may not be ready to buy immediately but who are interested and want more information. As we'll discuss in the next two chapters, lead capture and lead nurturing are two critical stages of the marketing process. They give us the ability to intelligently deal with interested prospects that may not yet be developed to the point of making a purchasing decision. Generally, these kinds of prospects make up the majority of all prospects and are crucial to filling your pipeline of future sales. If you didn't capture these interested non-buyers, you'd likely lose them forever. Your only hope would be that when they finally became ready to buy, they would remember your website among hundreds they may have visited and complete the buying cycle they began days, weeks, or months ago. Email also enables you to maintain a close relationship with your customer base and makes it easy to test and launch new products and services. Over time, as you build a relationship with your email subscribers, your database becomes an increasingly valuable marketing asset. Having a highly responsive list of email subscribers enables you to almost create cash on demand. You create a compelling offer with a response mechanism and send an email blast to your list. You'll get instant feedback whether it's a hit or a miss. It's a great way of cheaply testing offers prior to investing in more expensive media such as print or pay-per-click advertising. Despite the growth and popularity of social media, your database of email subscribers remains one of the most important elements of your online marketing strategy. As discussed in the previous few pages, social media reach has become problematic because only a small percentage of your followers will actually see your message. Even if your message were allowed to reach everyone, you'd probably get drowned out in all the noise. Funny cat videos, jokes, and memes will crowd out your marketing message. It's called social media for a reason. Even more importantly, an email database is an asset that you own. It's independent of whatever social media property may be the flavor of the month. Remember MySpace? While I don't think Facebook or Twitter are going away soon, it's a fast-moving space. If you build your business on someone else's platform and it starts to decline in popularity, your key online marketing asset becomes stranded. While email is a powerful media, it does have a few idiosyncrasies that you must be aware of. Here are some of the key do's and don'ts when it comes to email. Don't spam. There are strict rules about email marketing in most countries. Most notably that you must have the consent of the email recipient to send them marketing emails. That's why an opt-in form on your website is critical. Never, ever buy or compile lists of email addresses where the recipients haven't explicitly requested to be emailed. Not only is this very poor positioning, putting you in the same category as spammers, but it's also illegal. We'll discuss positioning in much more detail in Chapter 6. Be human. Don't write an email like a robot or like you're writing a formal letter. Email is a very personal media, and even if you're sending the same email to thousands of subscribers, write as though you're emailing a single person. Feel free to be a bit informal. Use a commercial email marketing system. Don't ever use Outlook, Gmail, or any other standard email service for mass email marketing. These services are designed for one-to-one -one emails, not one-to-many. Your account will either get shut down or blacklisted if you start mass emailing from these services. There are commercial email marketing systems that are cheap and easy to use. Some popular ones are Aweber, MailChimp, Infusionsoft, and active campaign. The great thing about using these services is that they automatically take care of a lot of the legal compliance for you. Things like having an unsubscribe option and your contact details at the bottom of your marketing emails. They also work hard to bypass spam filters and ensure good deliverability. Email regularly. If you rarely email your email database, they'll start to go cold. They may have opted into your email database but if they haven't heard from you for a long time, they may forget who you are and mark you as a spammer. 
Worse still, the value of your key online marketing asset starts to decay. To keep the relationship warm, stay in touch with your email subscribers at the very least monthly. Best practice is closer to weekly, but it also depends on your target market. I know some email marketers who email daily or even multiple times a day. There are no hard and fast rules when it comes to frequency. Just ensure when you email, it's relevant and value building. Give them value. If you only ever email your subscriber database when you want to sell them something, this will quickly get old and they'll either unsubscribe from your list, ignore your emails, or mark you as a spammer. All healthy relationships are based on an exchange of value. Ensure the majority of your emails are not sales pitches, but rather something that creates value for your subscribers. A good ratio is three value-building emails for every offer email. Automate Another great reason to use a commercial email marketing platform is automation. These platforms allow you to set up sequences that automatically get emailed to new subscribers. For example, when they subscribe, you could have your email marketing platform automatically send them a welcome email. A day later, it could send them a value-packed email helping them to better understand the product category they're interested in. Three days later, it could send an email telling them more about you and your business. A week later, it could invite them to schedule a phone call with you. All this can be done on autopilot. An email marketing platform can be one of the best salespeople in your organization. It will never take a sick day, never complain, and never forget to follow up. With email marketing, you have three challenges. Getting your email delivered. As discussed, the best way to ensure good email deliverability is to use a commercial email marketing platform. In addition to that, ensure that your email copy doesn't contain spammy phrases or use too many images or links. Getting your email opened. The best way to get your email opened is to have a compelling subject line. In the copywriting section of Chapter 2, we discussed copywriting strategy and headlines. Imagine your email among hundreds of others in your prospect's inbox. The job of your email subject line is to create curiosity and motivate the recipient to open your email. Getting your email read Some marketers advocate that you should keep emails to subscribers short. In reality, the length of your emails is secondary to their relevance and quality. If you write compelling content, it will get read. For example, prominent email marketer and blogger Ramit Sethi writes very long emails. He also emails his subscribers frequently. He has collected thousands of data points on his target market and knows exactly what they want to read. So while his emails are long, they are highly relevant and compelling to his target market. An alternative approach is to keep emails short by only having a teaser or summary in the email body. Readers are then invited to click on a link so they can read more on your website or blog. Email is a very powerful and personal media channel. It allows you to create compelling campaigns with a high degree of automation. When done right, it can be a valuable part of both an online and offline media strategy. Snail Mail In an age where the Internet, email, and social media play such huge roles in our personal and business communications, many have taken the view that postal mail, or snail mail, is all but dead. Nothing could be further from the truth. I'm extremely tech-savvy, and I've grown up with the Internet from its early dial-up days and prior. I've also been a co-founder of two very successful tech startups, that I helped build from zero right through to rapid growth and exit. Yet despite this background, or perhaps because of it, I regard snail mail as one of the most important and underutilized forms of marketing media. When it comes to your media strategy, you should understand that email doesn't replace postal mail. It complements it. We all love the speed and efficiency of all things virtual, However, it would be a mistake to underestimate the power of physical objects when it comes to moving people emotionally. And moving people emotionally towards a desired action is what marketing is all about. Imagine a man sending his wife an I love you text or email on their anniversary versus the same message communicated on a handwritten card with a bunch of her favorite flowers. There's a world of difference between the virtual and physical equivalents of the same message. Have you ever received one of those Google AdWords coupon postcards in the mail? 
It's instructive that the poster child for the digital age, Google, uses postal mail as part of its small business marketing strategy. Postal mail has a much longer lifespan and requires effort to dispose of. It's not uncommon for people to treasure and keep postal letters from significant people in their lives for decades. The same would rarely be the case for emails, which are ephemeral, in your inbox one moment, deleted and forgotten about the next. Another important point about postal mail is that it has gotten significantly less clutter over the past few years, which from a marketer's perspective is a dream come true. Clutter is the enemy of message cut-through, and having a media that has actually become less cluttered makes it all the more compelling. Conversely, email has become orders of magnitude more cluttered. The noise within email inboxes has gotten to ridiculous proportions, and even someone who is good at sorting it approaches it with a completely different frame of mind to postal mail. People handle their email with a finger hovering over the delete key. Anything that isn't immediately actionable gets deleted, forwarded, or forgotten about in an inbox archive. Until we figure out how to teleport physical objects from one location to another, like they do on Star Trek, we're reliant on couriers and the postal service to transport postal mail and physical objects for us. Without doubt, postal mail is a powerful media channel. However, as with all media, it's important not to get hung up or tied to a single channel. Your goal is to figure out how to get a good return on your media investment, whether that be postal mail or anything else. How to have an unlimited marketing budget No discussion of marketing or spending on media can be complete without discussing budget. When spending money on marketing, one of the following three things will occur. 1. Your marketing fails. That is, you make less in profit than you spent on your marketing expenses. Two, you have no idea if your marketing was a success or failure because you don't measure the results. Three, your marketing succeeds. That is, you make more in profit than you spent on your marketing. For each of these scenarios, there's a simple course of action. If your marketing consistently fails and loses you money, then stop and change what you're doing. If you don't measure your marketing results, that's just plain stupid because with the technology we have readily and cheaply available, it's easier than ever to track your marketing results and return on investment, ROI. If your marketing is working and consistently giving you a positive ROI, then you should crank it up and throw as much money as you can at it. One of the craziest things I see small business owners doing is setting a marketing budget. By setting a marketing budget, you are implying that either your marketing isn't working, and hence it's a pure expense, that is a waste of money, or you have no idea if it's working because you don't measure the results, and so you throw money at it in the hope that it's giving you some sort of positive result. If it's the former, then of course you need to set a budget because you can't have expenses running wild in your business. But a good question might be, why are you wasting money on marketing that isn't working? If it's the latter, then you need to change things pronto. You wouldn't hire an employee and not measure their productivity. So why on earth would you consistently pay for marketing and not know what result it's generating? If your marketing is working, that is, giving you a positive return on investment, why on earth would you limit it with a budget? It's like having a legal money printing press. This scenario is called money at a discount. If I was selling $100 bills for $80, wouldn't you buy as many as you could possibly get your hands on? Or would you say, Sorry, my budget for discounted $100 bills this month is only $800. I'll just take 10 please. That's why I always say have an unlimited budget for marketing that works. One argument I hear against this is concern about being able to handle the demand. Firstly, that's a great problem to have. Secondly, if you're truly receiving more demand than you can fill, this is the perfect opportunity to raise your prices. This will instantly boost your margins and bring you a better quality of client. The only time to set a marketing budget is when you're in the testing phase. In the testing phase, I advocate that you fail often and fail cheap until you have a winner. Test your headline, your offer, your ad positioning, and other variables. 
Then cut the losers and optimize the winners until you finally have a combination that gives you the best possible return on investment. Remember, the post office charges you the same amount to mail a crappy direct mail piece that bombs as they do a high converting direct mail piece that pulls in millions. Once you have a winner that pulls in more than it costs you, crank up the marketing spend and hence the speed of your legal money printing press. The Most Dangerous Number One is the most dangerous number in your business. It makes businesses brittle. Does your business have only one source of leads? One major supplier? One major customer? Rely on one type of media? Offer one type of product? To borrow a computer system term, does your business have a single point of failure? If so, your business is brittle, and a small change in circumstances outside of your control could have a devastating effect. That's a very tough situation to end up in. Many businesses were hit hard when Google changed its search engine algorithm. These businesses put all their marketing budget and effort on search engine optimization and literally overnight found their one source of leads gone. Similarly, when Google started to make changes to the types of paid ads it wanted to show, even advertisers who were paying Google enormous amounts of money each month were hit with the Google slap. That is, Google started to charge them four, five, sometimes even ten times as much as they did previously. This change forced the advertiser to stop their campaigns and try to fix the issue or find another source of leads. In the meantime, their business virtually stopped. Fax broadcasting was effectively outlawed in the United States, and many businesses that relied on that as a sole source of leads went broke. Some wise words of antiquity recommend that we build our house on a rock mass instead of on sand. That way, when the storm inevitably comes, our house doesn't cave in. The first step is to identify any scenarios where the number one can potentially hurt you. Here are some examples. What if your largest customer leaves you for a competitor, or what if they go out of business? What if there is a change of government legislation and the product you currently offer gets outlawed or regulated into oblivion? What if your main advertising strategy stops working? What if your advertising costs rise dramatically? What if your currently high search engine rankings disappear or pay-per-click rates rise sharply? What if your biggest supplier raises prices, has a supply shortage, or goes out of business? What if you rely on email marketing and the government cracks down further on this strategy? All of these scenarios can and do happen. If you rely on one of anything, you are leaving yourself in an exposed position. You're effectively building your house on a sandy foundation. When the storm comes and the floods rise, the house is going to collapse. Identify and eliminate single points of failure in your business. That way, if the laws change, if the advertising rates go up, if all of a sudden one specific strategy stops working as well as it used to, your business will be safe. You'll be the one with the power because you are not reliant on one of anything. Jim Rohn had an excellent philosophy on the matter. You've got to think winter in the summer. It's just too easy to get faked out when the sky is blue and the clouds are fleecy. You've got to prepare for winter, because it's coming. It always does. In the meantime, if none of these scenarios come to pass, at least you'll have built a more resilient and valuable business. A common scenario I see when it comes to media strategy is that many small businesses have only one source of new business. I advocate having at least five different sources of new leads and new customers. Further, I recommend that most of these five sources be in paid media, That is, they cost you money to market yourself. The reason paid media is so important is twofold. First, it's extremely reliable. If I pay a newspaper to run my ad, there's an extremely high probability the ad will actually be run. It's much harder to get such reliable and consistent lead flow from free, or seemingly free, marketing methods such as word of mouth. Second, paid marketing forces you to focus on return on investment, ROI. If a paid marketing method is not working, you cut it. You don't waste further time or money on it. Whereas, when the marketing method is nominally free, such as with word of mouth, we tend to be less ruthless, 
and often end up wasting huge amounts of time because we didn't have to pay anything up front. However, there's an opportunity cost which, if careful analysis is done, often translates to a surprisingly large amount of real money. The art and science of being able to consistently turn a dollar of paid advertising into a dollar or more of profits through direct response marketing will make your business resilient and can help you turn the tap on to rapid business growth. Chapter 3 Action Item What media will you use to reach your target market? Fill in square number 3 of your one-page marketing plan. Act 2. The During Phase The During Phase Section Summary In the During Phase, you're dealing with leads. Leads are people that know you and have indicated interest in what you have to offer by responding to your marketing message. In this phase, you'll capture these interested leads in a database system, nurture them with regular value-building information, and convert them into paying customers. The goal of this phase is to get your leads to like you and what you have to offer enough to buy from you for the first time. Once they've bought from you, they become a customer and enter the third and final phase of your marketing process. Chapter 4. Capturing Leads Chapter 4 Summary Capturing leads in a database system for future follow-up is critical to your marketing success. This is because only a very small percentage of interested leads may be ready to purchase from you immediately. Lead capture is all about properly handling interest and building your future sales pipeline. Highlights covered in this chapter include Why you should never try to sell directly from an advertisement and what to do instead How to transition from hunting to farming and ensure you always have a full pipeline of new business Why you shouldn't treat all prospects equally How to use an ethical bribe to uncover high-probability prospects. How to instantly increase the effectiveness of your advertising by 1,233%. Why some businesses get a constant flow of leads and prospects while others struggle. How to be seen as an expert and authority by your target market. Hunting versus Farming Imagine yourself as a hunter. You wake up in the morning, gather your weapons, and head out to the hunt. Some days you come back with a kill and your family eats a feast. Other days you come back empty-handed and your family goes hungry. The pressure is on every single day to hunt successfully. It's a constant battle. Now imagine yourself as a farmer. You plant your seeds and wait for them to be ready for the harvest. In the meantime, you nurture them and treat them with care. You water and tend to your crop. When they're ready, you start harvesting. In my experience, most businesses are hunters, not farmers. They cold call to generate new business. They spend huge amounts of time and energy trying to get a new customer and do anything to close the sale as soon as possible. Their advertising reeks of desperation as they try discounting and competing on price just to make a quick sale. They waste huge amounts of time pestering people who are not interested in their product or service. Most business owners are clueless about the purpose behind their marketing. They slap the name of their business on their ad with a pretty logo and some meaningless slogan claiming to be the leader in their industry or area. If you ask them what the purpose of their advertising is, most will say it's to sell their products or to get their name out there. This is wrong. Dead wrong. They may as well be flushing money down the toilet. In direct response marketing, the purpose of your advertising is to find people who are interested in what you do rather than trying to make an immediate sale from the ad. When your interested leads respond, you put them on your follow-up database so that you can build value for them, position yourself as an authority, and create a relationship built on trust. After doing this, the sale comes, if it's right for them, as a natural consequence. This will take a mindset shift but is an absolutely vital concept to understand. Why not try to sell to them from your ad? It's true that some people reading your ad might be ready to buy immediately, but the vast majority will not be ready to make a purchasing decision on the very day they read your ad, even if they are interested in what you do. 
If you don't put them in a database, then you've lost them. They might have been ready to buy in a month, six months, or a year. But since your advertising was one shot, you've completely wasted that opportunity. Your chances of them remembering your one-shot ad from six months ago is extremely slim. This kind of marketing is similar to farming. It is an investment in your future because as your database grows, so will your business and your results. Mining for gold with the ethical bribe Even in a narrow target market, all prospects should not be treated equally. All other things being equal, the more money you can spend marketing to high-probability prospects, the better your chances are of converting them to a customer. Just like the proverbial archer mentioned in Chapter 1, who has a limited number of arrows, you have a limited supply of money for your marketing campaign, so it's essential you invest it wisely. For example, if you have $1,000 to spend on an ad campaign which reaches 1,000 people, you're essentially spending a dollar per prospect. Now assume that out of the 1,000 people the ad reaches, 100 are potential prospects for your product. By treating them equally, as you would have to do with mass marketing, you're wasting $900 on uninterested and unmotivated prospects to reach the 100 who are interested. What if, instead of treating them all equally, you could sift, sort, and screen so that you were only dealing with high-probability prospects and not wasting valuable time and marketing dollars on uninterested and unmotivated prospects. You could then spend the whole $1,000 on the 100 high-probability prospects. That would allow you to spend $10 on wooing each of them, instead of the measly $1 per prospect you'd have if you treated them all equally. With 10 times the firepower aimed at the right targets, do you think we'd have a better conversion rate? Of course. But how do we separate the wheat from the chaff? The short answer is, we bribe them into telling us. Don't worry, there's nothing underhanded here. We offer an ethical bribe to get them to identify themselves to us. For example, our friend the photographer could offer a free DVD telling prospective brides exactly what they should look for in a wedding photographer and showcasing some of his work. A very simple lead-generating ad could be headlined, Free DVD reveals the seven costly mistakes to avoid when choosing a photographer for your wedding day. Anyone requesting this ethical bribe would be identifying themselves as a high-probability prospect. You now have at least their name and address, which would go on to your marketing database. Remember, the goal is to simply generate leads. Avoid the temptation of trying to sell from your ad. At this early stage, you just want to sift out the uninterested and unmotivated so that you can build your database of high-probability prospects. Here's the other big reason you want to avoid selling directly from your ad. At any given time, on average, about 3% of your target market are highly motivated and ready to buy immediately. These are the prospects most mass marketing hopes to convert. However, there's a further 7% who are very open to buying and another 30% who are interested but not right now. The next 30% are not interested, and finally the last 30% wouldn't even take your product if it was free. A copy of this visual element can be accessed at marketingaudiobook.com. If you tried selling directly from your ad, you'd be targeting only the 3% who are ready to buy immediately and losing the other 97%. By creating a lead-generating ad, you increase your addressable market to 40%. You do this by capturing the 3% who are immediate buyers, but also by capturing the 7% who are open to talking, as well as the 30% who are interested, but not right now. By going from a 3% addressable market to 40%, you're increasing the effectiveness of your advertising by 1,233%. This also has a secondary side effect with the people who are ready to buy immediately. They see you're not desperate to sell or discount your product or service. They see that you are interested in building a relationship first, rather than just going for the jugular to make a sale. This kind of marketing is just like sowing seeds on a farm. When you educate and teach, you are seen as an expert and an authority. You're no longer questioned. Instead, you are obeyed and seen to have a personal, genuine, helpful interest in other people.
A sample campaign might have an offer of a free report or video series promising to educate your prospect about the things they need to be aware of, how to avoid being ripped off, and what they should look for. Once your prospect receives the value-packed information, you've delivered on all the promises made in your advertisement. This skyrockets your trustworthiness, positions you as the expert, and sets you apart from your competition. You haven't put sales pressure into your ad just to make a quick sale. Instead, you're just starting with the process of getting them to raise their hand. You're asking them to contact you, and when they do, they have identified themselves to you as a high-probability prospect. Managing Your Gold Mine As a kid, I used to watch the futuristic cartoon, The Jetsons. I was sure by the time I grew up, we'd all be riding around in flying cars. Well, according to my wife, I've yet to grow up. But nevertheless, many years later, my primary form of transportation remains terrestrial. Sure, modern cars have some nice bells and whistles. But in their basic form and function, cars haven't really changed in over 100 years. So that begs the question... Why aren't we all zipping around in personal flying machines? Personal flight technology has been around for some time, and the cost of it is surprisingly low. In mass production, it would certainly come pretty close to what cars cost. So what's the problem? The short answer is there's simply no infrastructure to support personal flight. The vast majority of our infrastructure is built around cars. Modern houses, buildings, and cities are all built to accommodate cars. Why do some businesses get a constant flow of leads and prospects while others struggle to get any? The answer is the same as the answer to our personal flight dilemma. Infrastructure Some businesses have built a marketing infrastructure which constantly brings in new leads, follows them up, nurtures and converts them into raving fan customers. Other businesses, in fact, I would say most businesses, do what I call random acts of marketing. They throw up an ad here, an ad there, perhaps a website or a brochure. They're not building infrastructure, a system whereby a cold lead enters one end and a raving fan customer comes out of the other. These sporadic, one-shot, random acts of marketing usually end up costing more than they bring in, which is demoralizing and sometimes leads business owners to say ridiculous things like, marketing doesn't work in my industry. To build a system... We need to think it through from start to end. We need to understand how it works and what resources we'll need to run it. At the absolute center of your marketing infrastructure is your database of customers and prospects, but to manage your database effectively, you really need a Customer Relationship Management, CRM, system. The CRM system is your marketing nerve center. It's where you manage your gold mine. You want all your leads, all your customer interactions, to end up in your CRM. This is where things get exciting. Chapter 4 Action Item What is your lead capture system? Fill in square number 4 of your one-page marketing plan. Chapter 5 Nurturing Leads Chapter 5 Summary Nurturing leads is the process of taking people from being vaguely interested in what you have to offer to desiring it and wanting to do business with you. The lead nurturing process ensures that leads are interested, motivated, qualified, and predisposed to buying from you before you ever try to sell to them. Highlights covered in this chapter include The Secret Behind the Guinness World Records' World's Greatest Salesman why the money is in the follow-up and how to leverage this, how to annihilate your competitors and put yourself in a class of your own, a simple strategy for quickly moving prospects further into the buying cycle, why a marketing infrastructure is critical to your business success and how to create one, the three major types of people you need in your team to make your business work, how to leverage international talent to ensure your business success. The Secret Behind the World's Greatest Salesman Joe Girard is listed in the Guinness World Records as the world's greatest salesman. He sold more retail big-ticket items, one at a time, than any other salesperson in recorded history. Was he selling some amazing new technology that everyone had to have? No. Was he selling to the mega-rich? 
Wrong again. He sold ordinary cars to ordinary people. Between 1963 and 1978, he sold over 13,000 cars at a Chevrolet dealership. His stats are amazing. In total, he sold 13,001 cars. That's an average of six cars per day. On his best day, he sold 18 vehicles. On his best month, he sold 174. In his best year, he sold 1,425. Joe Girard sold more cars by himself than 95% of all the dealerships in North America. To make his feat even more incredible, he sold them at retail, one vehicle at a time. No bulk fleet deals. So what was the secret to Joe's success? He lists several, including working hard and being likable. Without discounting these factors, I'm sure there were thousands of salesmen at that time who had those admirable qualities, but they didn't sell a fraction of the volume that Joe did. One of the standout things that Joe did was to constantly keep in touch with his customers. He sent a personalized greeting card every month to his entire list of customers. In January, it would be a Happy New Year card, and inside it would say, I like you. He would then sign his name and stamp it with the details of the dealership where he worked. In February, his list might get a Valentine's Day card. Again, inside the message was the same, I like you. He would vary the size and color of the envelope, and each was hand-addressed and stamped. This was critical to getting past the postal mail equivalent of spam filters, where people stand over the trash can and discard all the items that look like ads, scams, credit card offers, and other types of junk mail. He wanted his customers to open his envelope, see his name and the positive message inside, and feel good. He did this month after month, year after year, in the knowledge that they would eventually need a new car. And when they did, who do you think would have been top of mind? By the end of his career, he was sending out 13,000 cards per month and needed to hire an assistant to help him. By the time he was a decade into his career, almost two-thirds of his sales were to repeat customers. It got to the point where customers had to set appointments in advance to come in and buy from him. Contrast that with other car salespeople who just stood around waiting and hoping for walk-in traffic. Marketing Like a Farmer What would you guess the average number of times a salesperson follows up a lead? If you guessed once or twice, you'd be about right. 50% of salespeople give up after one contact, 65% give up after two, and 79.8% give up after three shots. Imagine that a farmer planted seeds and then refused to water them more than once or twice. Would he have a successful harvest? Hardly. When it comes to marketing, The money is in the follow-up. Based on this, we build the irresistible lead-nurturing model. A copy of this visual element can be accessed at marketingaudiobook.com. Immediately after you've captured a lead, they should go into your system where repeated contacts are made over time. These are not contacts where you obnoxiously try to pester them into buying. You build a relationship, giving them value in advance of them buying anything from you and in the process building trust and demonstrating authority in your field of expertise. Accept the fact most people will not be ready to buy right away. Put them in a database, and by database this could be email or physical direct mail, preferably both. Mail them something regularly to stay in touch, positioning yourself as an expert in your industry or field. More on that in the next chapter. Like a farmer, you prepare your prospects to become ready for harvesting. Just as Joe Girard did, over time you too can build a huge pipeline of potential customers who will have you at top of mind when they're ready to buy. Even more exciting is that they'll already be predisposed to doing business with you because of the value you've created in advance. You won't need to convince or put on a hard sell. The sale just becomes the next logical step. This growing list of prospects and the relationship you have with them will become the most valuable asset in your business. It's the golden goose. Now, when the prospect is finally ready to buy, you are a welcome, invited guest rather than a pest. The most important thing you can take away from this message is to become a marketing farmer. It's a simple three-step process. 
1. Advertise with the intention of finding people who are interested in what you do. Do this by offering a free report, video, CD, etc. Any kind of relevant, free information that presents a solution to a problem they have will work. This positions you as an expert and an educator rather than a salesperson. Which would you prefer to buy from? 2. Add them to your database. 3. Continually nurture them and provide them with value. For example, a newsletter on your industry or information on how to get the most from whatever it is you do or offer. Important point. Do not make this a constant sales pitch. That will become old very quickly. Be sure to offer them valuable information with an occasional pitch or special offer. Most important of all, be sure to keep in contact regularly. Otherwise, the prospect will forget you and your relationship will then be relegated to that of a cold prospect and pest salesperson. If you become a marketing farmer, you'll have a rich and continual harvest as your database grows in number and quality. Building Your Marketing Infrastructure In the previous chapter, we introduced the concept of advertising with the intention of capturing leads. Capturing leads is one thing, but what you do with these leads is really what separates the boys from the men, so to speak. Have you ever had the experience of inquiring about a product or service and never receiving any follow-up? Or perhaps you received a quote and got one lazy follow-up call and nothing further? This is a sign of a broken marketing infrastructure. The sad thing is that a lot, even most, of the follow-up grunt work can be automated using a CRM system. Most good CRM systems can be set up to automatically fire off an email or SMS to a client or alert a salesperson to call and follow up. The automation can be triggered based on some action taken by the prospect, by tracking inquiries and purchases, or based on preset timers. Automation systems allow you to robotically sort, sift, and screen prospects and customers so that you can leverage your time more effectively. Now that you have a database of high-probability prospects, your job is to market to them until they buy or die. It may seem like I'm advocating being obnoxious and pestering people to buy until they cave in. Nothing could be further from the truth. Traditional selling training often focuses on pressure tactics like always be closing, and other silly little close techniques which are based on pressure. It makes the seller a pest who the prospect wants to avoid. Instead of being a pest, I advocate becoming a welcome guest. Send your high-probability prospects a continuous stream of value until they're ready to buy. This could be in the form of tutorials, articles, case studies, or even something as simple as a monthly newsletter that's related to their area of interest. This builds trust, goodwill, and positions you as an expert and educator, rather than just a salesperson going for the jugular. Various technology tools make it easy to automate this continuous follow-up mechanism, making this a cost-effective and scalable way of building up a huge pipeline of interested and motivated prospects. Some of these prospects will convert into customers immediately, while others will do so weeks, months, or even years later. The point is that by the time they're ready to buy, you've already built a solid relationship with them based on value and trust. This makes you the logical choice when it comes time for them to make a buying decision. This is one of the most ethical and painless ways of selling because it's based completely on trust and an exchange of value. While your competitors are blindly shooting arrows every which way in the hope of hitting one of the 3% of immediate buyers, with this technique, you are focusing all of your firepower on a clear and visible target. Your marketing infrastructure will be made up of assets. Here are a few of the assets I've successfully deployed in marketing infrastructures that I've built or helped manage. Lead capture websites, free recorded message info lines, newsletters, blogs, free reports, direct mail sequences, email sequences, social media, online videos and DVDs, podcasts and audio CDs, print ads, handwritten notes, email autoresponders, SMS autoresponders, shock and awe packages, discussed in the next section. These are all part of my marketing infrastructure. I continue to build bigger and more sophisticated assets, but these are some of which make up my core. Each one of these has a place and purpose. 
All the ads that I run are designed to plug cold leads into this system and convert them into raving fan customers. Of course, it does take time and money to build such a marketing infrastructure. But just like building physical infrastructure like roads or a railway network, the bulk of the time and cost goes into the initial build. After that, it's just maintenance. And here's the exciting thing. Thanks to advances in technology, much of my marketing system is automated, which gives me enormous leverage. When I find a combination that works, I can redeploy it over and over and reliably get the same results. As I continue to build out my marketing infrastructure, my results continue to improve. What about you? Are you building your marketing infrastructure? Are you constantly building on and improving your marketing systems? Doing so is what will put you far ahead of your competitors who will be just fluffing about with their random acts of marketing. Lumpy Mail and the Shock and Awe Package in Chapter 3, we discuss the power of postal mail as a media channel. Lumpy mail is a way of taking this powerful media channel and putting it on steroids. Think about your postal mail sorting habits. You have a pile of envelopes, then you notice one of the envelopes has something in it that makes it lumpy. There's a 3D physical object in it, perhaps a book, DVD, or a trinket of some sort. Which of your envelopes is going to get opened first and get the most attention? If you're like most people, it will be the lumpy one. Lumpy mail is an attention getter and allows you to get very creative with your direct mail campaigns. In the direct mail industry, trinkets purposefully inserted for attracting attention are called grabbers. Grabbers often set the theme of your sales letter. For example, you might insert a small plastic trash can into the envelope with the theme of the sales letter being, Stop Wasting Money. Or perhaps you insert a magnet with the theme being, Attract More Clients. It sounds corny, and it probably is, but it gets attention, entertains, and more importantly, if done right, it gets great results. Books, CDs, and DVDs are other excellent items you can insert in envelopes to make them lumpy. Other than just attracting attention once off when being opened, these items generally don't get thrown away. Your customers and prospects will likely keep what you sent them indefinitely and it will be a constant reminder of you. Taking lumpy mail to the next level is the shock and awe package. The shock and awe package is perhaps one of the most powerful direct response marketing follow-up tools in existence. When done right, it can skyrocket conversions and position you far above your competitors. In fact, it's so powerful it essentially annihilates your competitors and puts you in a class of your own. The awesome thing about shock and awe packages is that even when your competitors find out what you're doing, they usually won't dare copy you. Practically no one does this. In the previous chapter, we discussed the importance of capturing the details of prospects who have indicated interest. The purpose of this, of course, is to keep in touch with them and nurture them to the point where they're ready to become a customer. Now, think back to the last time you inquired about a product or service. Perhaps you phoned in, emailed, or submitted your inquiry through a web page. You did the typical prospect dance of, send me more information. What did you get back in response to this request? Likely, the organization you were inquiring with did one of the following things. Sent you a link to a web page. Sent you an email, perhaps accompanied by some attachments. Spoke with you over the phone and answered your questions. It may have been all or some of the above. See what's happening? They're responding to your inquiry in the cheapest and most efficient manner. There's nothing wrong with cheap and efficient, but no one is going to be entertained, delighted, or inspired by it. No one's going to stop and say, Wow, they sent me a PDF file with all the specifications. How awesome! With your first few interactions with prospects, you have the opportunity to make one of the following three impressions. One, same, same. Two, crappy. Three, mind-blowingly amazing. Most business owners choose option one, a surprisingly large number choose option two, and almost no one chooses option three. Your job is to devise a way to be option three. Fortunately, you don't need to reinvent the wheel. A shock and awe package is one of the best ways to do this. A shock and awe package is essentially a physical box that you mail or deliver to prospects 
full of unique, benefit-laden assets related to your business and industry. Here are some of the things you can and should include in a shock and awe package. Books. People are conditioned to almost never throw books out. Big bonus points if it's a book you wrote. Books are an amazing positioning tool and catapult you from salesperson to educator and expert authority instantly. I'm doing this right now with this book. DVDs or CDs introducing yourself and the specific problems your product, service, or business solves for your prospect. Testimonials from past clients in video, audio, or written form. Clippings from media mentions or features about you, your product, or industry. Brochures, sales letters, or other marketing material. Independent reports or white papers proving your point or demonstrating the value of your type of product or service. A sample of your products or services. Coupons or gift cards with a face value on them can be powerful, as it feels like wasting money to just throw these out. They also motivate the prospect to try you out. Unusual trinkets and gifts that entertain, inform, and wow. I've heard of everything from personalized coffee mugs to iPads being included. Handwritten notes thanking them for inquiring or recapping a conversation you've had with them over the phone. What? I hear you say. Snail mail in this instant access, on-demand information age? The answer is yes. Trust me, no one loves technology more than I do. I'm a sucker for the latest i-anything, and I'm constantly glued to one of many screens. However, like most people, I love receiving packages, even more so when they're unexpected. While people's snail mail used to be much more voluminous, it's now easier than ever to cut through with physical mail, and especially packages. If something in a FedEx box lands on your desk, how long is it before you rip it open? If you are like most people, I suspect it's not very long. I'm certainly not saying you shouldn't send immediate responses to information inquiries using the phone, email, or web, but understand that the first few interactions with a prospect are sacred and should be carefully orchestrated. Nothing should be left to chance. A shock and awe pack is an amazing tool for delivering that wow emotion to your prospect. A shock and awe pack should do three things. Give your prospect amazing, unexpected value. Position you as an expert and trusted authority in your field. Move your prospect further down the buying cycle than they would otherwise have been. How much more powerful is this than the standard, sure, I'll shoot an email with more information. A common objection to shock and awe packages is that they're too expensive. In the previous chapter, we discussed that, all other things being equal, the more money you can spend marketing to high-probability prospects, the better your chances are of converting them to a customer. That's what the shock and awe pack is all about. If you can outspend your competitor wooing and wowing prospects, you'll run rings around them. Of course, you must know your numbers particularly numbers like customer lifetime value, otherwise you will go negative. You can't substitute good marketing for bad maths. The numbers obviously have to make sense. Unless you're in an extremely low-margin, purely transactional business, something I really don't recommend you be in, then the numbers should work and sending the shock and awe pack should be very economical. Don't make the mistake of being cheap and efficient when it comes to wooing prospects. Shock and awe packages are a huge competitive advantage. Most competitors won't understand them, and even those who do usually won't have the courage to use them because, if they're like most businesses, they won't know their numbers. They will likely perceive them as being too expensive. After all, there are cheaper and more efficient ways to acquire customers. Let your competitors do cheap and efficient marketing while yours entertains, delights, inspires, and wows. It will put you worlds apart. Become a prolific marketer. One of the commonalities amongst high-growth businesses is that they focus heavily on marketing and make a lot of offers. Some of these offers end up being misses and some end up being hits. The exciting part is that you don't need many hits to offset your misses, especially if you place small bets by first testing with a small segment of your list. By making many offers, you start to get a very good sense of what works and what doesn't. When you become a prolific marketer, it's much easier to spot trends 
and scientifically measure response by split testing. Another important attribute of high-growth businesses is that they're not timid with their offers. They take risks, use compelling copy, and make outrageous guarantees. Could it really be that simple? Making more compelling and more frequent offers? The short answer is yes. The fundamentals never change. Sure, there are now more media channels through which to make offers, new marketing technology to help you track return on investment and split test, but the fundamentals never change. More compelling and more frequent offers equals rapid business growth. Being more prolific with your marketing will create a buzz in your business. Your clients and prospects will start to notice you more and you'll start to cut through the clutter and fill up your sales pipeline. Any change that becomes part of your routine, whether positive or negative, will have a profound impact over time. If you make the crafting and sending of offers to your list of clients and prospects a part of your regular routine, Within a short time, you'll have a dramatically different business. Making regular offers will make you a better marketer. Getting good at the science of marketing is the key to rapid business growth. And when you get better, everything will get better for you. Make it up, make it real, and make it recur. In school, you were taught to be independent. You had to pass math, science, and English to get to the next level. Imagine you pooled your talents with a couple of friends. One friend, who was good at math, did all the math tests. Another friend, who was good at science, did all the science tests. Finally, you did all the English tests because that's what you were good at. In school, that type of collaborative work structure would have been called cheating, and all three of you might have been disciplined or even expelled. Yet in business, Pooling different talents in pursuit of a single goal is exactly the type of structure that results in successful outcomes. Business is a team sport, one where you're never going to win on your own. It takes different types to make a business work. Here are the three major types that it takes. The entrepreneur. This is the ideas person or visionary. They see a problem or gap in the market and are willing to take risks so they can solve that problem for a profit. They make it up. For example, seeing a gap in the market for a particular product and hiring all the right people needed to get it up and running. The specialist. This is an implementer of your vision. They could be an engineer, a venture capitalist, a graphic designer. They take your vision, or a part of it, and help make it reality. They make it real. For example, building the factory to produce the product, getting the tooling right, creating the product packaging. The manager. They come in every day and make sure things get done, work gets delivered, and the vision is on track. They make it recur. Running the factory, making sure shipments get out on time, making sure quality is right. It takes all three types for business success, yet it's extremely rare for a single person to be good at all three. Many small business owners are either the entrepreneur or the specialist or both, but rarely the manager. Even if you're currently the sole operator of your business, you need to find a way to have all three bases covered. You can do this by outsourcing or hiring. Small business owners often try to take on too much and things inevitably slip through the gaps. Lack of a manager role is often why a marketing infrastructure never gets up and running properly. It's why monthly newsletters don't go out or why shock and awe packs never get sent. The business owner might agree these are great lead-nurturing ideas, and they are, but they're busy being the entrepreneur or specialist, and in the absence of a manager taking care of the marketing infrastructure, they don't get done. So what's the point of having sophisticated marketing tools and assets like a shock and awe pack if they don't consistently get deployed? You've probably already got all three roles handled in many other parts of your business. For example, when you were starting out, You had the idea and vision for what you were going to build. You made it up. You then might have hired a lawyer to set up the business's legal structure. Your lawyer made it real. Then every year you might get your accountant to take care of your tax returns and compliance. Your accountant makes it recur. It's critical you do the same for your marketing infrastructure. Get systems into place. We talk more about systems in Chapter 7. Come up with a marketing ideas, or better still, Shamelessly steal the ones in this book, hire graphic designers, web developers, and copywriters to make it real, then get admin help or use fulfillment services to make it recur. 
As discussed earlier, much of this can be automated, and what can't be automated should be delegated. It's just too important to neglect. Lack of a functional, running, marketing infrastructure will harm or possibly kill your business. The reason you likely don't neglect your annual tax obligations is because it's enforced upon you by the government. They have a calendar which dictates when tax returns need to be filed and when various taxes need to be paid. You can replicate a similar forcing mechanism with a marketing calendar. A marketing calendar sets out what marketing activities have to happen on a daily, weekly, monthly, quarterly, and annual basis, and you put those into your schedule like you would all other important business events. For example, you might decide the following marketing calendar is right for your business. Daily. Check social media for mentions and respond appropriately. Weekly. Write a blog post and send the link in an email blast to email list subscribers. Monthly. Mail customers and prospects a printed newsletter or postcard. Quarterly. Send past customers who haven't purchased recently a reactivation letter. Annually. Send all customers a gift basket thanking them for their business. After you've locked in what needs to be done and when, the only other question you need to answer is who will be responsible for delivering on each of these scheduled marketing activities. Again, if you are a small or sole operator, don't try and do it all yourself. Where possible, make these repetitive operational activities someone else's responsibility. In addition to regular, scheduled marketing activities, you need to consider event-triggered marketing activities. For example, consider these event triggers and their corresponding actions. You meet a potential prospect at a business event. Transcribe their details from their business card into your CRM system and put them on your monthly newsletter slash postcard list. You get an inbound sales inquiry. Send them a handwritten note and your shock and awe package. You get a new email list subscriber from your blog. Add them to your CRM system, which automatically emails them an educational five-part video series over the next 30 days. Received a customer complaint. After the issue is resolved, send them a handwritten apology note and a $100 discount coupon on their next purchase. Again, as far as possible, make these event-triggered activities someone else's responsibility. This will free you up to do higher-level marketing tasks like designing and testing new marketing campaigns or improving the value of your offering. There are few business activities that pay as highly as working on your marketing. Even if your business is currently small, hire admin help in the form of a manager type who will run the factory for you and make sure your scheduled and event-triggered marketing activities recur. As entrepreneurs, we have a can-do mindset. This often means when something needs to be done, we are tempted to just roll up our sleeves and just do it. However, spending a lot of time doing things that aren't your area of expertise or aren't a good use of your time can quickly become a very expensive exercise. Remember, money is a renewable resource. You can always get more money, but you can never get more time. Another common concern with outsourcing or delegating tasks is quality. Will they get done as well as if you were doing them yourself? The answer is probably not, but a rule of thumb I like to use is, if someone else can do it 80% as good as you can, then you should delegate it. Letting go can be difficult, especially if you're a control freak and perfectionist like most entrepreneurial types are, but it's necessary if you're going to get scalability and leverage in your business. Otherwise, you end up effectively paying yourself minimum wage for routine tasks while sacrificing high-value tasks such as building your marketing infrastructure, which can take your business to a whole new level. Some timeless wisdom from Jim Rohn. Learn how to separate the majors and the minors. A lot of people don't do well simply because they major in minor things. Don't mistake movement for achievement. It's easy to get faked out by being busy. The question is, busy doing what? Days are expensive. When you spend a day, you have one less day to spend. So make sure you spend each one wisely. We can no more afford to spend major time on minor things than we can to spend minor time on major things. Time is more valuable than money. You can get more money, but you cannot get more time. Time is the best-kept secret of the rich. 
Finally, the most common complaint is that it's too expensive to hire or outsource help. This may have been true a few years ago, but not anymore thanks to the wonder of geo-arbitrage. There is an enormous pool of talent in Southeast Asia, India, and Eastern Europe that will work for you at a fraction of the price of local employees and contractors. There's a good reason large companies move a lot of their routine operations to these locations. They're full of workers who are talented, eager, well-educated, and speak English fluently. You can assign tasks and have them magically happen while you sleep. Importantly, it's not just about cost, but also about scalability. Locally, you would need to comply with all sorts of red tape when hiring and firing employees or even contractors. However, thanks to massive online job boards like Upwork, Freelancer, and 99designs, you can hire an army of personal assistants, graphic designers, web developers, and almost any other skill you can imagine. All of these can be hired on demand to work on a project basis or as part of your team on an ongoing basis. The production of this book is a perfect example of this. It was written by me in Australia, edited by a copy editor based in the United States who works for an Armenian company. The cover design was done by a graphic designer in India, and my researcher was based in the Philippines. The Internet has broken down geographical barriers and enabled anyone to have a global workforce. Never before has so much talent been so readily available and been so cost-effective. Of course, from time to time, the tired old argument about patriotism and creating local jobs comes up. But how many local jobs are you going to create if you fail to implement critical marketing strategies and go out of business? Globalization of labor and talent is a reality and has been for some time. Previously, the domain of only large multinational companies, it's now an easy reach of small to medium businesses and entrepreneurs like you and I. This is a real game changer. As entrepreneurs, our job is to embrace change and find ways to leverage and profit from it, rather than fight it. As you become more successful, you'll help create local jobs as a byproduct of your success. When you upgrade your house, give generously to a good cause, or buy a new car, you'll be creating local jobs and benefiting your local community, most of which wouldn't have been possible if your business had failed. Chapter 5 Action Item what is your lead nurturing system? Fill in square number five of your one-page marketing plan. Chapter 6. Sales Conversion Chapter 6 Summary Sales conversion is all about creating enough trust and demonstrating enough value to motivate interested leads to become paying customers. Positioning yourself correctly will make the sales conversion process easy and natural for both you and your customer. Highlights covered in this chapter include why positioning is the critical factor when it comes to charging high prices for your products and services, how to position yourself as a welcome guest rather than a pest when selling, why the odds are stacked against you if you're a small to medium business and what to do to level the playing field, how to massively reduce the perceived risk that customers see when it comes to buying from you, how to instantly generate trust and credibility when selling, how to correctly price your products and services, how to remove the roadblocks that are preventing people from buying. Every Dog Bites You've likely heard the corny old joke, which appears in the classic movie The Pink Panther Strikes Again. There, Peter Sellers, who plays the hapless Inspector Clouseau, sees a cute dog and, in his ridiculous French accent, asks the man standing near it, Does your dog bite? The man shakes his head and replies, No. Clouseau then reaches out to pat the dog, whereupon the dog lashes out and bites his hand. He then turns back to the man and indignantly asks, I thought you said your dog didn't bite. The man casually replies, That is not my dog. The people you're selling to have been bitten too many times and now think all dogs bite. The fact is, unless you're the well-known incumbent in your industry, you're not even starting the selling process in neutral territory, but rather you're starting behind in negative territory. Even though you're an ethical operator, your prospects are cynical and don't trust you. Unfortunately, it's a case of guilty until proven innocent, 
and you have to work your way from negative to positive territory and win their trust before a sale can be made. With trust being the major barrier to a sale, you've got to have some solid strategies for sales conversion. While a comprehensive program of sales training is out of the scope of this book, in this chapter we're going to look at a few strategies and tactics that will make the sales conversion process much easier. Specifically, we're going to discuss the central role played by positioning and how to make proper positioning a part of your trust-based sales conversion process. In the previous two chapters, we covered how to capture and nurture high-probability leads in order to build trust, value, and authority. All this was done with the purpose of making the sales conversion process natural and easy. By the time you get them to the point of sales conversion, they should already be pre-framed, pre-motivated, and pre-interested, and essentially asking to buy from you. If you have to convince them or put on the hard sell, then you likely need to improve your lead nurturing process. Most salespeople position themselves either as desperate beggars or as obnoxious, pushy salespeople using silly, outdated closing techniques like ABC, always be closing, the trial close, or the assumptive close. These techniques have become a joke in selling, and unless you're selling low-value products like vacuum cleaners door-to-door, they'll create more distrust with your prospect rather than help you. Another equally bad approach taken in many new businesses is expecting sales to happen by the mere fact that the business exists. Some open a physical store, others start a website and expect sales to just start rolling in. Their marketing strategy is hope. And sure, they make a small number of sales just by virtue of being there when a random prospect wanders by. But that is a guaranteed path to frustration. Many such businesses make just enough in sales to torture themselves to death. They then conclude the market or their industry is too competitive. Truth be told, I don't know of any market or industry that is not competitive. But one thing I know for certain is that in any market or industry you look at, no matter how competitive, there'll be someone doing really well and there'll be someone struggling. So if we were honest with ourselves we couldn't really put it down to a problem with a market or industry. So what's the problem? The problem is likely that they're positioning themselves as a commodity, a me-too type of business. When you position yourself in this way, your only marketing weapons are to shout as loudly as possible, which is very expensive, or to discount your prices as far as possible, which is dangerous. Unless you are a Costco, Walmart, or other such behemoth, You really don't want price to be your key differentiator, as that's a battle you won't win. At this stage, many of these businesses realize their folly and start making dubious and unquantifiable claims like being the best, the highest quality, etc. There's no money in your product or service. Whether you're selling freshly baked bread, accounting services, or IT support, The way you market yourself will have a dramatic impact on the clients you attract and the amount that you can charge for your services. A commonly held belief is that it's all about the product, so if you have a better product or service, people will automatically be more likely to buy from you and pay you more for it. While this is true to some extent, the law of diminishing returns comes into play when your product or service reaches a good enough level. After all, how much better can your IT support or accounting services or bread be than that of your competition? Once you've reached a level of competence, the real profit comes from the way you market yourself. How much does a world-class violinist make? Well, that depends on how he markets himself. Have you ever heard of Joshua Bell? He's one of the finest classical musicians in the world. He plays to packed audiences all around the world, making upwards of $1,000 per minute. The violin that he plays is a Stradivarius violin built in 1713, currently valued at $3.5 million. This particular Stradivarius violin, being close to 300 years old, is renowned to be the most beautiful-sounding violin ever crafted. So, here we have the finest violinist in the world playing the most beautiful violin ever. It's safe to say that Bell, as a musician, is the best at what he does. At the height of his career, he was approached by the Washington Post to participate in a social experiment. 
They wanted him to play at a local subway for an hour, during which thousands of people would walk by and hear him play. So, on the morning of January 12, 2007, Bell played through a set list of classical masterpieces with his violin case open. Can you guess how much the finest violinist in the world, playing a beautiful $3.5 million violin made in an hour? A grand total of $32. To see the video of the Joshua Bell social experiment, visit marketingaudiobook.com. The finest violinist playing the most beautiful instrument made a meager $32 from his customers. The same violinist played in a Boston concert hall a few nights earlier. It was a performance where the audience members paid $100 or more per ticket. During that event, he earned over $60,000 per hour. The same talented musician, playing the same music on the same violin, yet in one instance, he earns $32 an hour, and in another, he earns $60,000 per hour. What made the dramatic difference? In a word, positioning. If you're a professional musician and you position yourself as a subway busker, your customers will treat you as such and pay you accordingly. Conversely, if you position yourself as a professional concert performer, you attract a totally different customer and once again get paid accordingly. In other words, people will generally take you at your own appraisal, unless proven otherwise. Of course, you can't cheat by positioning yourself as a professional musician and then show up and be unable to perform at a high level. The same is true regardless what business you're in. If you've got a quality product or service, what's stopping you from positioning it at a much higher level, offering it at a premium price and attracting a much higher quality of customer? Resolve to stop positioning yourself as a commodity and competing solely on price. The result to your bottom line will be phenomenal. Transitioning from Pest to Welcome Guest How do you feel about a dear friend who shows up at your front door? Contrast this with how you feel about a stranger selling door-to-door who interrupts your dinner or family time. What's the difference? The former is a welcome guest, someone you have a relationship and connection with. The latter is a pest. You don't know who he is, where he's from, and most likely, you don't even want or need what he's selling. The welcome guest brings value to your life, whereas the pest is just there to interrupt you and to take. Wouldn't it be great if you could approach a prospect and be treated by them as a welcome guest rather than a pest? Selling suddenly becomes much easier and more pleasant when you are welcomed with open arms and when the prospect is deeply interested in what you have to offer. This is the transformation I'd like you to make in your business and in your marketing. Transition from being a pest to a welcome guest. Most businesses try to sell without first creating trust. They either cold call or advertise using outdated methods that no longer work. The problem with this is you're asking your customer to make a decision when they have no idea who you are or what you're about. They don't know you, don't like you, and don't trust you yet. It's like proposing marriage on a first date. Sure, it may work once in a blue moon, but do you really want to stake your whole business on a strategy like that? And so you end up with a poor closing ratio of, say, 1 in 10 or 1 in 20, and you waste a significant amount of time, energy, and money dealing with unqualified prospects. What's more, you waste a lot of money on poor advertising. You have a generic ad, and you get people calling up, and you say to them, Sure, I can come out and see you, or, Sure, I can help you. The problem with this is they barely know you and are probably just price shopping, so your conversion rate is probably going to be at a far lower level than it could be. At this stage, many business owners get hooked on the hopium drug. Hopium is a drug that travels through your body and mind when you think you have an interested prospect who is sending you positive signals, but has no intention of buying from you. The drug is usually activated when your prospect tells you, Tell me more about your product. Send me a quote, or send me more information. You know what I mean, right? Someone calls your office and shows interest in what you have to offer, and then instantaneously you feel the rush of excitement that this is going to be your next sale. Then a few days or a few weeks later, after continually chasing them, you get hit with the silent treatment. 
you've had some good conversations and they've expressed interest in what you have to offer, then all of a sudden everything stops and goes cold. You try calling them back once or twice. You even send a follow-up email, but nothing. They just disappear. You figure you've somehow lost the sale, and you don't know what you did wrong or what was wrong with your product. It makes selling feel like such a painful and arduous process. Hopium is dangerous because it's not based on the truth of what your prospect is really thinking. The faster you detox from hopium, the sooner you'll stop wasting your selling time chasing prospects who aren't a true fit for your solution. Over the years, prospects have become more and more skeptical. They've been burnt too many times and they simply don't believe you. So the problem is you're not even starting at zero, you're starting in negative territory. And the old school, close, 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 sell, sell, sell approach doesn't work the way it used to. Potential clients get their back up and end up doing nothing because they don't trust you. Instead, you need to move towards the model of educate, educate, educate. With education, you build trust. With education, you position yourself as an expert. With education, you build relationships. With education, you make the selling process easier for both buyer and seller. As discussed in the previous chapter, instead of trying to sell to them straight off the bat, The first thing you do is offer your readers something of value that educates them about a problem they have. A free report, free CD, free DVD, online webinar, etc. are all great educational tools you can use. Delaying the sale accomplishes two things. First, it shows you're willing to give long before you take, which breaks down sales resistance. Second, it presents you as an educator and expert in your field. Think about it. Who would you prefer to buy from? a pushy salesperson salivating for their next commission, or an expert educator who has your interests at heart and wants to help you solve your problem. You must stop selling and start educating, consulting, and advising prospects about the benefits your products and services deliver as opposed to each and every competitor in your category. Best you listen to that again. It could be worth a fortune to you. Let's face it. No one wants to be seen as a stereotypical salesperson who is pushy and untrustworthy. However, if you think about yourself as a doctor who diagnoses and then prescribes solutions to people's problems, then I'm sure you'd be much more comfortable selling under those circumstances as a trusted, educated, knowledgeable, qualified, confident, capable advisor. And that is exactly who you need to be perceived as in the eyes and mind of your prospects, someone who educates them, and solves their problems. This would be a good time to share with you my definition of an entrepreneur, someone who solves people's problems at a profit. Bottom line, don't let them think you are in sales for one second. The best way to do all this is consultative advisory selling using a nurturing system. More on that shortly. You must see yourself as an agent of change, a creator of great value, benefit, and advantage in the lives of your customers and prospects. Become the expert in your category or industry. Quite honestly, everybody is generally trying to be an expert. It's just their marketing sucks. The coffee shop is trying to make the best coffee. It just sucks at marketing that fact. Consultative advisory selling is the most cost-effective, the most enduring, the most impactful and the most powerful marketing strategy a business owner could ever devise. The balance of power is now in your hands as long as you choose to consult, advise, and educate prospects or clients about the benefit that your product brings to them. It's the only way to take the power back from the buyer in the chaotic world we live in today. So stop selling and start educating and advising. Your clients will appreciate you more, and so will your bank manager. Manufacturing Trust Ask most people and they'll tell you they despise dealing with large, dumb companies. Poor service, indifferent staff, and out-of-touch management are hallmarks of large companies. Yet, for some reason, we keep dealing with them despite knowing that there are probably much better options out there. One of the biggest reasons behind this is a comfort that while the experience may not be great, it likely won't be horrible. As the saying goes, better the devil you know than the devil you don't. 
Fly-by-night operators and snake oil salesmen have made many people distrust small businesses by default. People know that while a large company might not give the very best service, they are unlikely to be outright scammed by them. If you run a small business, that puts you at an immediate disadvantage. A customer doing in-depth due diligence on you may come to the conclusion that you are trustworthy and provide great service, but the vast majority of customers won't go to that effort. They will often take a cursory glance and judge you by your cover. That's why it's increasingly important to present your business in a way that conveys trust and confidence. The strategic use of technology is one way that you can level the playing field. In times not so long ago, access to business technology tools was cost prohibitive for small businesses and hence was the domain of large companies. The Internet, Software as a Service, SAAS, and Cloud Computing have leveled the playing field. A famous cartoon published in The New Yorker depicts a dog sitting at a computer and is captioned, On the Internet, nobody knows you're a dog. This illustrates how technology can help make the little guy look like one of the big guys, leveling the playing field and helping fight the trust bias against small businesses. The following are some inexpensive ways you can use technology to help you present your business in a larger and more professional manner. Other than the fact that they will help you fight the small business trust bias, many of these tools will help you run and scale your business in a much more efficient manner. Website your website is probably one of the first places prospects go to check you out. Beware of the following signals which scream to potential prospects that you are small or potentially untrustworthy. No phone number listed. Phone numbers should be prominently listed at the top of every page. A P.O. box address or no address listed instead of a proper physical business address. Even if you work from home, you can use virtual office services to meet with customers and to display 